Good evening. Well, we're starting off tonight with this Made in Mexico um, Strat, and it's in for a refret. It's got some fairly worn out frets down here. Um, so it's going to get a refret and a good setup too. And it's fitted with the Dave Gilmore um, EMGs and the bridge is sort of just lost. It lost its mind a little bit. It's kind of over tilted and got too much backwards movement and stuff. So we're going to do a full refret setup. I think it needs a new, well, it needs a tusk string tree there. I mean, look at the amount of, whoops, look at the actual amount of, uh, you can see it compared, but compared to the string next to it, the G, look at how much that's pressed down with it, whereas the G gets nothing. So I'm going to take a look at that G because that looks actually straight through. So I have a feeling that might be in need of a um, string tree, excuse me, a string tree there. Anyway, I'll contact or check with Justin about that. But we'll go for one there and one there probably. Only because it needs it. Not because they look prettier than anything. They look better than that and they're made of tusks. So, so we're going to, um, I think, well, the main thing is just get sort of stuck in straight away really with removing the strings, removing the neck and pulling the old frets. And I've got the old fret press lined up over there waiting to go. Um, I've got some lovely brass uh, extra hardware in to really upgrade this Made in Mexico tram. So we've got the great big brass thing. We've got a lovely chunk of brass here and brass screws as well. Um, just for your information, if you haven't seen one of these before, that, that is in case you need to ground your strings or your bridge. But apparently uh, when you use EMGs like this, active ones because there's a battery underneath here somewhere when you use these emgs set you don't need to ground your bridge well you know okay i take 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 uh take their advice so um i'm charging this phone at the moment for because uh, i didn't charge it before i came up which is a bit silly of me but anyway so it means i'm tethered for the time being and i'm sort of dragging the cable around so i'm not going to get the greatest view and of course we're also only on one camera right now so the aim here will be just to have this somewhere where you can see it and i can get on and dismantle I'll take the neck off dismantle the guitar i was going to say so with this um anything to be aware of well yes funny you should ask that made in mexico strats I can see some strange puckering here on the finish. They have some of them in some batches and I don't know what order or logic applies, but some of them the finish likes to fall off. And I've found myself having to say over the years now, having to warn people that while it's a very small chance, there is unfortunately a, a chance that these Mexicos require uh, some work if the finish starts falling off. Now I've got a, a gut feeling that this one isn't going to do that, but I could um, have to be prepared to be wrong. Um, so, with that in mind, I always make a rather lengthy point in the in initial email back to a prospective customer about the finish on this, and it. It bothers me a bit because it sounds on the first hello it sounds like a really scary uh thing to have to kind of say to somebody well actually you do realize that it's you know and it's more of a well i, I don't really wish i didn't have to say this but there's a very slight possibility and it's unlikely but it has happened in the past and i just need you to know that if and the problem with the whatever batch of uh, guitars or series of batches whenever it's happened with these Fender Mexicos and some Fender USA's as well. Um, the only other guitar I've had it happen to was, as it happened, was a Gordon Smith. So it's not, you know, it's not sort of con confined to Fenders. Anyway, for some reason or other, whether it's a batch, a chemical thing, or whether it's the condition of the wood or whatever, it turns out that when this happens the finish is just not very strongly attached to the underlying wood and as a result um, 
when you start pulling the frets up, uh, you can find that it it finish starts can start to flake off with as you're removing the frets. Now, par partly if that happens, there's a sort of bit of a reason that encourages it to happen, and that is the way that fender does its finishing anyway, which is a fret first, spray later um, approach. So they obviously radius the board back to um, to bare wood. I don't think they use any particular sanding sealer or anything, but they go back to wood, then they press the frets in and then they spray the finish over the top. And that looks okay. It has a, 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 a trademark characteristic look to it and you probably know it when you see it even if you haven't thought about it 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 the, the finish looks like it sort of ruffles just before each fret and when you're looking at the glossy fingerboard in the light you will see a sort of crumple you'll see a little sort of ripple in the in the reflections i guess you call it like little bars of light glinting along the fretboard and that is as the material kind of rucks up and over the frets. Um, now because of that, if you think about it, to begin with, even if it's a good, adhere, you know, properly adhering finish, you're, you're basically draping a carpet over two different materials, wood, and then you come up to this metal fret and then you kind of go up and over that. And it doesn't go right, right microscopically into the corners where the fret crown sits it just sort of jumps up and over the fret. And so you have this slight air gap underneath, doesn't really show other than that little funny ripple of light I've mentioned, reflection ripple. But what it means is when you come to remove the fret, you have to break this carpet and then you end up, um, the carpet is prone anyway, but especially if the adhesion isn't good. The carpet is prone to sort of pull back, recede, you might say, uh, away from where it's been broken, which is there. And sometimes when it breaks on the edge, it recedes inwards and chips. So whenever, that, so it basically to remove these frets, you have to break, you tend to break um, the, what do you call it? The finish, because the finish is up and over the sides. Now it's usually cleaned off, so there's no, um, is none left on the top. It's been long since played off or, or rounded off with sandpaper or whatever. But nonetheless, it still climbs a little way up the side of the fret. You never get it all off. And so that when you pull that fret out, guess what? It's going to pull up the finish that's stuck to the, still sticking to the side of the fret. And that's inevitable. So I'm going to keep these strings, I'm going to use these as the uh, thingy for sacrificial strings when I come to do the precision fret leveling after the refret. Um, yeah, so so the, the, that approach of spraying after the frets are fitted does encourage the, the finish to break, even where the adhesion is good. And if it's, if it's poor, then it's even worse or more likely to give way. Now, this should be a 9.5 inch radius uh, neck generally and so the frets and that's what it's looking like so what I really want is I want my fret wire to be just slightly under that and here I've got my fret wire now this is a, tr a tricky one these are 275 mils wide um, and I've no, sorry they're 265 and the alternatives were a 255 width or a 275 so I've gone for the 275 which gives us also a little bit of extra height so um, so this is going to be close, but a little, start out a little taller, but I much prefer to do that because it gives me uh, some important leveling room. What you don't want is to go too close to the original gauge and then find that, you, you know, you, you, you basically, by the time you've leveled it back and if you've got a couple of seating problems and you have to level those out, um, you know, you, you may find yourself uh, basically as low feeling as they were before you refretted, which seems a bit pointless to me because um, you know this this is quite an old 20 year old guitar now I think and you don't want it to feel 
no point refretting it really if you're going to just go back to exactly the same height um, as the material or the frets you've taken off. So, um, now we've got an interesting thing, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, but anyway, first of all, here's our fret wire, and what I always do to begin with is I cut it at the halfway point because it's easy to manage for a start. Now, uh, before I do that, I might just move this slightly out of the way. And what I tend to do is I tend to just mark up with a marker pen the two ends. Now, only because occasionally these two ends can be just slightly flattened. And I'm not quite sure why that is, but sometimes it is, not always. It could be some, some of the ways that they are cut in the factory or whatever. But just to be on the safe side, I, I like to remove that last two centimeters on each one. You can afford to do it. And so now what I do is I stand it up here, equally spaced if you like, and then I cut in the middle and hold on to both sides. And there we have my two pieces. Um, and I can cut off the little worrying bit that I, it could be absolutely fine on here. I'm going to do it anyway because it's a it's a habit that's so hard to weaken. Where is he? Where is the other end? Now the next thing will be to get these. Uh, well, I could I'll bend them and then I'll come back to cutting them a little bit later. I don't mind if it falls down there. That's okay. Right. So the first thing I'm going to do is measure this on the ground here. It, it may be these come free bent at nine and a half. It tends to be a quite common thing. So that actually, if I just make this a relaxed mode, I would say that's absolutely dead on nine and a half to begin with. So they probably already pre-radiced it. Um, and this one might be, who knows, it actually looks a fraction less. So slightly different radii. Um, yeah. So question is, are they different? Let's hold them up together here. Now they're very similar, actually, just a little bit different in length, that's all. Um, that's absolutely perfect. I mean, I wa might want to go and try and get it a tiny fraction underneath. So I don't know. let's see if you can see me over there, going over towards the thing known as the fret bendery thing. So, yeah, you should be able to see me. Um, and I'm taking this over. I'm just going to run this, see how it runs through here. Is that adding any tightness to it? Might just be. That's actually got a spot on the 9.5, finally enough. So I'm going to tighten that just a tiny bit. It's very unscientific, so you have to do it and then try again if you've overdone it or underdone it. So if this comes to just under 9.5, I will be happy. Looking for the air gap. That's still on 9.5. I can never remember which way to turn it to reduce the size. Uh, I should make a mark on there. I think this is now going to be more like 6. <laughs> 7.25. So suddenly that's become well, you know, that's become a bit tighter, but it's actually not bad. It's, we could argue that it is a minuscule fraction of a pipe. Like I say, guessing at it. I forget which way it goes. So if I've over tightened it here, I can just gently, quite crudely bend it out. And then I'll come back to it again. Run it through again, see what we get. Okay, let's just put that down there, 
0.5. Well, that's so close to the mark. I'll do. Let's just check where they are. Yep. See, the big one's just a fraction. tighter of a curve what am i doing oh there. okay see that's even tighter than this one well, that's because i didn't do that one to the same did i let's do this one the same okay okay, okay so these will the reason i slightly did it over radius is they'll they'll sort of grip in a little bit now with with this creature here, the aim will be to, um, the, key, the key thing in getting this right is to, um, what's the key thing? I think we'll, yes, we'll take off the, let's take off the tunes as well. Uh, the key thing is, in getting the fretting right, is to prepare everything um, thoroughly. So preparing not only the, the fingerboard and the slots, um, but also preparing the frets and getting the fingerboard, the underlying substrate, as good as it can be, is a way of being as sure as you can be that your new frets are going to go on. Wow, well, that's loose already. Yeah, you want to make sure that they seat in properly. Now, with a strap like this, you start out with a kind of choice. Um, you see where the frets meet at the end there they have a little what looks like a little bit of filler in there um, and you can either cut out that filler um, and the advantages of doing that is that if you want to you can use a saw to go all the way through and that's the best way of guaranteeing a clean slot with no detritus sitting in it when you come to uh, pressing the new frets um, now the downside of it is, is you lose this little filled piece, um, but in a way, if you want to keep the little pre-filled piece, it looks tidy, so it means you don't technically have to do it yourself, but you have to treat this then as a, uh, a bound neck and you have to undercut the frets, which isn't a problem, you basically undercut or cut the tang a little short and you allow a little roof to go over the edge bit here which is okay, um, but the main consideration against it is that it leaves you um, having to hand scrape the slots and stop before the end here. And that is always slightly less efficient um, when it comes to cleaning those slots out than running a saw all the way through. So if you choose to take the saw all the way through option, you can tick the, I can be certain that I've cleaned the slots out box. Um, you can also add to your to-do list, as a price of having done that, the, you add to your to-do list, fill the end gaps, if that's how you want it to look, and possibly touch up the edge of the fingerboard with new fresh poly. So that's a, a couple of little extra things. Now, you have to weigh up really what the consequences are if you what's most important actually is what you weigh up and so for me the most important thing is frets are is our frets that seat properly um i want the best possible fret laying i can get and so in some ways whoops i felt that bit in some ways adding uh touch-ups of finish on the edges is the easier uh, part, you know, it's the easier activity, the simpler activity. So got wax and plastic in different parts. Um, yeah, so I might be tempted to say, or I would be tempted to say, look, I I don't want to take the risk of having crud captured in these slots and then causing one of my frets to stand up and giving me an extremely high fret, which is going to have a consequence on the other frets. Um, as I try and level it out. 
So to avoid that, um, it would make far more sense for me. I'll put this for a minute. And I want to normally, I would want to put this put it back in here. Yeah, so um, it would make more sense to me to have to take minimize the chance of a bad fretting because that's the pain in the butt expensive bit pulling all these frets out that you've already put in and while I'm here I'm just going to do something that may upset some people I'm going to by eye I'm going to hand carve out this here nut we've got a new one now it means I'm just going to cut into the clear finish or the sorry the amber finish that's been sprayed on and the reason I'm doing this is that I just want to make sure that when it comes out, when I get it out, it's going to come out without breaking any of the surrounding finish. Um, doesn't always guarantee it because sometimes, believe it or not, in doing the little cut here, it can also cause some chipping. So there is no surefire way of guaranteeing finish stays in place. Now, the first thing I want to try is a, a gentle tappering tapaging and we want to get this nut out and preferably without having to cut it out but cutting it out is a last resort that we will refer refer re, re, resort to with extreme prejudice if necessary so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to hold this here and i'm going to see if it wants to tap out now sometimes you can help this process I haven't just helped it you can help it by starting with a small one and putting a using something that digs in a little bit um, not got as much sort of blunt force attached to it but it can create a little bite in the end of the nut which may help it move this seems to want to just skid off to be honest Yeah, that's not so bad. I'm pleased with that. Save us having to cut it off. So we've got a curved one and we will replace it with a curved one. But I've got, a, I've got where is it gone? I've got one here with my string trees. And here's my curved seven and a half inch radius. No, not seven and a half, nine and a half. So those will go back on. So that's good. Now we come to the, let us remove our frets and removal of frets is some people on a rosewood board would put water on there um what am i looking for oh yes i'm looking for a bit of this a bit of this and a bit of that yeah they would use rosewood uh, rosewood boards would use a bit of water and some heat i'm going to not use water because the gloss finish doesn't really it's not going to absorb any water so it's not going to soften the wood any so what i am going to do is i'm going to gently hold down one one i'm going to hold down the headstock here and before i do forgive me i'll do one thing there's a notion a notion that um and if you want to help really release the original frets uh, putting it, the neck into a bit of a back bow, a reverse curve, is a good thing to do, they say. And it's a good thing to do because um, if you bend it in that sort of back bowed way, you get to prise apart, gently prise apart the... Uh, I never know which... No, this is a made in Mexico, isn't it? It's not going to be that. It's going to be one that I think I've got in my bag. But I've got another one here. Is it this one? get to mark up some of them yeah so the idea is the principle is we will by bending it backwards we will create a no i think that's not the right one i'll get the one from my bag yeah we create a bit of uh, or alleviate the grip of the neck wood on the, the frets that's the idea okay where is my made in mexico Taylor GS Mini on it. I've got another one marked made in Mexico. Look at that one. Encore India. Is that the same as the main? Oh dear. I have to take that one home. Let's try and find what we've got. It's not that one. That's too 
too big by a country mile. So we did have one sitting here with Mim written on it. It's got Encore India, we know it's not that one. Uh, is it sitting in one of these containers here? No. So we think it's not that one, that's got Taylor GS Mini, we know that's going do, and this is the right one. Okay, so if we want to, um, here we go, if we want to back bow this, we basically tighten up the, the truss rod, uh, which I've done here a fair amount. And then we should get, we do, we get a kind of spread backwards. Now, while that, I'm gonna turn you around a bit, come this way, that isn't going to, let's turn it this way, that isn't going to make the frets spring out. Um, it should ease their passage out of here as much as is possible. Now, what we will also do, and I don't know, to be honest, don't know how effective this also is on a, um, on a maple type neck, is we're going to get some heat on there by a miracle of a soldering iron. Now I'm going to use my Hosco. I have been given by Stephen a really cool pair of side, side snips, which do a great job as well. Um, uh, he, he's taken these, let's see what you can see. Uh, yes. He's taken these snips and he's ground them down on one side to a really perfectly flat surface. And, and then he also built into it a kind of gouge where the, theoretically the fret is supposed to go through. I haven't managed to make that bit work for me, but they do they do start out pretty well. Now, um, what I'm gonna probably use is these ultra fine Hosco ones that I have bought. Now, even those have started to suffer the result of working on some stainless steel. I don't, you won't be able to see it now, but they've actually, they've actually um, dinged a little bit at this face. That's stainless steel for you, and that's why luthiers talk about charging more money. So I'm going to start these. I'm probably going to put this here so we're not, at least there's some chance of hellfire. Where are you? Oh yes, there you are. A small chance of seeing what I'm doing without my hand being totally in the way, although it's mostly, oh for goodness sakes, it's, it's just by default it's mostly in the way, isn't it? <sighs> I don't have a means, I don't have an outside flying camera angle. I think the only way I'm going to get this to work is to momentarily unplug it, put it there and just put it there and hope that I can, I'm missing everything now, hope that I can do the business. A few of these things out of the way. So remember, we're saying no, no uh, water involved in here, just some heat. So I'm going to turn on the thing. So we're going to use we're, we're back bowed to get these out. Now the question is, is there any purpose, any point in cutting down the edges here? I'm not entirely sure there is. I mean, some people might say, well, yes, that will help to break your your seal, if you like. Now, I can't see a way that's gonna do that for me without doing possibly more damage. Uh, let's see, I'm not, I'm not convinced. Now, I don't want this to be super hot, but the way I'm gonna do this is I'm going to warm up the soldering iron and I'm going, I'm going to actually, well, maybe before I even get it hot, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the, the nice sharp edge of this tool to gently kind of bite the lift into here to start with. And there's my first mark. And I'll do it, I can do it to all of them. So it's actually quite difficult to do, especially when they're stuck down. So you have to sort of press down in, in the, into the wood a little bit. Um, with these here, kind of very similar just a slightly different angle, same same approach really. But this is actually trying to bite their fret a little bit more, so I want to avoid that happening. So that's a bit in there. So the finer ones you can get, the, the better things will be. So I'm make, basically making a start point 
on all of these as with as little downforce as I can possibly get away with just to lift to get the thing starting to lift and then I don't have to fight with it later on and it's very much a matter of feel I've shown how to do it in the past just by using uh, a snap-on blade it is entirely possible um, you know that you don't have to have expensive tools but a finely uh, flattened set of pullers like this um, does make the process easier and sometimes you'll just find that it doesn't want to do it it's kind of resisting but then you have to kind of give it a little bit of down force and the problem with a bit of down force is that it tends to it will start to dent the uh, edge of the fingerboard a little tiny bit but sometimes you just have to do it you've got to get these things moving so I've got them all very slightly lifted and here we'll go with the first one so putting that on the edge here I'm going to allow some heat to go into the, the fret now the idea was originally that um, a little bit of heat would soften well basically I think this the theory is soften everything that the frets coming into touch with whether it's the glue the poly the wood and you name it anything slightly softened is probably better than being cold and crispy and so out comes the first fret. If I give you a close up look, you can see it's a pretty good um, pull. Okay, you can see where the, the finish is breaking, little crumbs of it. We will have to, um, you can see there's a clear edge, which is, um, you wouldn't have it quite the same way if this had been all finished in one flat surface and then fretted on top, you'd probably get you wouldn't get this step down that we've got now. So we've got a definite lip here that we need to sand away and we can't really avoid doing that if we want to be sure of a nice, easy to, uh, easy to fret to surface. So I'm just gonna show a couple more from this angle and then I'll probably just get the thing plugged in again so I can, uh, I can num, 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 keep the battery charging so that I can run two cameras and do a proper thing when it comes to it. So, so I'm just sort of walking along very gently. So obviously we're, we're kind of biting inwards so that the, we're breaking as we bite in and lift the fret, we're also probably breaking the last bit of the seal and you can see all the bits. Now I've got a little homemade tool I'll show you in a minute that I use for cleaning up these fret slots and it's pretty effective, but you still, by definition, you run just outside of the normal footprint, which is why if you're refretting, they, there's, um, when you, when, when you, I don't know if you've ever seen in the shops where you buy fret wire, the online shops, there's a thing called repair wire. And I don't know if you're like me, you've seen it there and never bought it thinking, what the hell is repair wire? Is it some sort of special soft wire that does something that regular wire can't do? Well, it turns out repair wire is fret wire of the same gauge as a normal gauge wire, but with a thicker tang. And the idea being is it, it's presupposing that you're having had a tang pushed into the wood already, um, that your existing tang might be a little bit on the loose side. Um, and if you're refretting, of course, you don't want to fret and then the frets fall out. And so they create this repair wire to be basically fret wire with a slightly thicker than normal tang to use. Now, you don't want to put that in uh, the first time because um, if your fret slots are 50.5, uh, half a millimeter wide, and you come along with a tang, a uh, fret a repair wire with a tang that's say 0.6 or 0.75, let's say for argument's sake, um, because that extra fatness on the tang will end up causing your neck to go into a back bow, whether you like it or not. And you either have to correct that by loading the, the neck with strings and hope that the force, the strings will pull it back flat or curved, or you have to sort of use an active uh, two-way truss rod if you've got one to hope you can dial some curve back into it. Uh, really don't want to be in that position. So, um, yeah, 
rule is never use that type of wire um, unless you absolutely know you have to or should do. Um, right, let's get you charging again. So we're back on sort of long view, not very exciting, but just so you can see what's going on. Um, so now I'm going to just carry on and get all of them. I know I'm in the way now, but it's about getting it done. And then what I'll do is I'll, once I've got this, uh, I will make my final decision about do we, see this one doesn't want to come up, do we or don't we cut all the way through? And I think for the sake of, the only reason I wouldn't cut all the way through with a saw is if I really couldn't do an end fill on my own and I just thought at all costs I had to uh, protect the end fill. And of course, if the end fill isn't just a piece of poly or super glue or whatever, is, as it will be on here, um, if the end fill is really a full binding going down the side, then you've got no choice. You're not going to cut all the way through with a saw. So you don't have the luxury of starting knowing that the slots are cleaned out. You have to then you have to then cut, uh, sorry, you have to clear the slots out with other kinds of tools, scraping up to and stopping at the binding on either side, which is what you'd do if you wanted to retain these end fills on this neck. But I think it makes far better sense to get a good refret that we go all the way through um, and saw our way comfortably to the other side. And then we'll do a little fill at the end um, with either a wood filler, putty, um, which takes 24 hours to set, which adds a bit of, believe it or not, adds about a day <laughs> to the, the way the, ski, the, the schedule works, probably adds a day to doing this, but we're not in a crazy hurry. So we can, we can factor that in. It just means I have to rewrite my schedule a little bit. Um, so we will, I mean, there are other things you can use. You can close the gap up. And actually a lot of vintage guitars didn't have end fill uh, gaps at all. They were, um, they put the frets in and then they, they beveled the metal flush to the, um, the wood. And I think <clears throat> in some ways the end fill protected, well it didn't really. I'd like to think that people thought the end fill protected <clears throat> in case the neck shrunk a very tiny amount then if you had the end fill theoretically your um, if your neck would shrunk instead of the metal poking out at the end of the fret what you'd get is um, you'd get the sort of filler of poly sticking out which was easier to stand smooth. I don't really think that was done for that reason. I think it was this cosmetic thing. People preferred the look of something that was filled with clear finish or, or um, you know a bit of wood coloured filler <clears throat> um, and so they went with that. But actually on, on, a, on many vintage uh, fingerboards you will see the metal of the fret, the tang goes right to the edge and of course when if and when a neck does shrink in slightly in different weather you, you, you will then find what happens is the metal just appears to extend a tiny, well it does extend a tiny little bit over the wood and, and it can be very sharp because it only takes a hundredth of a mil of the, this razor sharp metal to stick out and your fingers will find it. So um, the truth is if you if you uh, undercut and use an end fill even when the neck shrinks on that it still ends up with something bulging out the side but what bulges out the side is uh, in fact only um, polyurethane or poly finish. But it still is a bump and you still have to sand it back. So it doesn't really, doesn't really help you avoid fret sprout as they call it. So there we have all of yonder thingies taken out. Now the thing to do whenever you've done this is immediately get straight back to slackening your truss rod off. We want this neck now flat really before we do any fretting. And that probably makes sense to just drop it technically back to 
point where it's slack. Um, I'll check it with a straight edge in a second. So let's just give a bit of a better view. So what I'm going to use in a minute is my cool little tool. Full, but I probably need to put some more, uh, put some more sandpaper on it. I've got two of them here. One, one's got some paper on it. One needs some paper. That's okay. Um, so let's put the heaty thing out of the way. Um, so solder in the drain island, Ireland, solder island. Now that I need for my work tonight, later on. That's going back in there. Uh, no, I might need a tiny adjustment yet. Don't crush the gun, jump the gun. So I'm going to get just an old fashioned, bog standard thing here. And I'm going to say, what's it doing? Okay, a tiny bit of relief in there. So just for my peace of mind, I'm going to add a fraction of turn just to cancel that out. Oops. Still <coughs> a tiny bit of concave. Not Obviously not all necks will go dead straight when the truss rod is slack. That's good. Um, so when your truss rod is slack, you may find it, like this one does, has a little bit of uh, relief in it. That's absolutely fine, but we just need to make it come back out to whatever uh, whatever we have to do to get it to be flat, which is what I've done. Now, the next bit, which I probably could do with taking a minute or two to do. What I want to achieve tonight is to get... Um, let's chuck this fret wire away. Um, I want to have the frets... Pressed in, uh, pressed in and glued tonight, so they're setting overnight. And I need some of this, and I need some pigeon oil, and I need a little surface to cut on. Yeah, so this is all heading towards getting our thing done. Um, oh, let's have a look. I think I better do the, the next bit actually would be sawing saw wing through now with all finishes they're all flaky they all risk breaking so about the only way you're going to avoid it is to start this one and cut inwards start this one cut inwards start this one try and cut inwards and that should minimize the breakout we don't want we don't want it flaking out don't pull it to the other end so we're pulling inwards to begin with. And I'm just going to go all the way down this side, pulling inwards, first of all, first of all. And then we'll do the other side, pulling inwards. Um, I had a fun thing happen this week. My old schoolmate, Steve, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched any of my videos, Steve, but if you're watching this one, Steve Gregory from Coventry, <laughs> back in the old days. And we played together in the, in a terrible schoolboy band, which didn't know whether it was prog rock or punk. I think it was a terrible, unholy mixture of the two. But Steve was our bass player at the time, and I was the so-called guitarist. Um, and that was when I had my Vile Satellite 65T, uh, the most horrible guitar ever made or played. But when I still doff my cap to, because it kept me playing guitar and I despite its crapness I didn't give up so it couldn't have been well either it wasn't so bad or my desire to play was just unstoppable uh, so I, I carried on but so now you see what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the uh, run the sword all the way through and I'm basically clearing the slot for sure. There is no way that any detritus is going to stick in these slots. So that the first thing I know is that absolutely nothing is going to prevent the new tang, new tang sitting in. Anyway, so Steve uh, contacted me and he said after all these years, he's not played bass, I think in all these years. He, uh, when we finished school, he went into the, the British Army and then ended up being stationed in Germany, as most British Army, many British Army 
squaddies were. And uh, what was it? He was the Royal something and mechanical engineers, Remy, wasn't it, Steve? If you watch this, anyway, um, yeah, he went to he went to Germany, and funny enough, by quirk of weirdness, he ended up in a town in the very early 80s where he met a, a lady and got married and became German. But unbeknownst to me and him, years later, a few years, not many years later, a few years later, I um, I, ended up in, I ended up in that town myself working in a completely different line of work um, and ended up in a relationship with a young lady from that town too so we could have been neighbors at some point except it didn't kind of go that way for me and my girlfriend but we had we were together a good couple of years and it's a very, very nice person she was too but steve got married and stayed in that town and of course i never bumped into him there he was he would have been doing um, army type, or well, actually I think he, he, he then went and set up a, a mechanical mechanical car business, fixing car fixing type business. And um, engineering, car engineering, that, you know the what I'm saying. Anyway, and uh, so we wouldn't have crossed our path. My thing was petrochemicals, yeah. Um, actually I was working, I was located in the steel pipe production plant in that town and I I was part of a sort of an inspection team for a, for a client, petrochemical client who was building a pipeline to go across the North Sea. Um, so it was, it sounds glamorous, but at that time it was just sitting in a filthy old German steel mill, a pipe mill, which was noisy, dark. I mean, it was wonderful too in its, in its scale and the noise and the kind of weirdness of all this large-scale engineering, which I've always been, always been kind of astonished by, you know, in, in its scale. But it wasn't glamorous in any sense of the way. Um, so, yeah, so we wouldn't have, our crofts wouldn't have passed path from the crossed um, but anyway so yes you contacted me the, we, we I think we, we saw each other at a at a um, reunion a few years ago and met up in Coventry once but um, yeah so he's taken up playing so he's getting a, he's, he's taking up a guitar not the bass which is cool <laughs> so he's he's getting himself a, a Gretsch Steve was always a big fan of The Clash and a lot of different sort of band, punk bands like of that era. Um, and uh, so I kind of think, yeah, a sort of rockabilly guitar would be quite the, quite the style for him. So I, I'm kind of hoping to get to see it when he gets it. If you're listening, Steve, watching, listening, watching, is this the radio? If you're watching, if you ever see this, let me know how it goes. I do, we, I, I remember that Steve, oh, this is, this ain't gonna do it. This is, this is too curved to cut it to size. I suppose I'll have to trim it like this. Not ideal. Um, yeah, the, I think Steve, it was Steve the, a couple of years ago found the long lost t dreadful tape of doom, which was a, an audio cassette recorded of a, a time we played a gig in inverted commas in somebody's front room uh, in Coventry. Um, and it was, it was just terrible. I mean, by my modern standards, I, I would, cringe I think I cringed then but well you know we tried bless us um, 
we didn't know anything any better or worse. Anyway, this isn't a brilliantly manufactured one, but it's not impossible. We can still use it. So, let's put these bits in the bin. So, this may all end up being a one camera shot. Um, so, let's have a look. So here we have our, <clears throat> ta-da. Right, now we've got, we know that the frets have all come out. The finish seems to have survived mostly. There's a chip off the side there, but that's an old chip. So that's already lost a bit, which I hadn't seen. But now what I want to do is I want to make sure that these edges here um, are sanded smooth. Now it's really difficult to do, like I said, because first things is that the this crusty lip of poly um, is, is quite noticeable because of the way the finish was applied after the fretting had been done. So we've got this kind of parked up wall of grime, which is going to try, it's going to want to try and stop our new fret sitting smoothly on there. But you can possibly see that I've scraped back quite a lot of it. I can still feel the drop off where the, the finish ends and the um, go down, down to wood, but hopefully if I just keep that as smooth as possible and get rid of the crunchiness that it's got on all these others, the idea is that the new fret, which if I cut one for fun, I won't cut it for fun, I'll cut it like it's the real, the real thing. It's the real thing. So what am I going to do? Have I decided? Am I going to or am I going to? Am I going to overcut, bevel to the end or undercut? I think I'll undercut, but I will start with this and go to here so let's call that my number one fret for the time being so here it is now when i press that in there i am hoping that once it's pressed in um i'm not sure actually what the thickness of this tang is i've chucked these away but i can then cover one if this is actually uh, no, I need my, I need my micrometer thing. Uh, if it turns out to be a little on the small uh, side, then we may have to just do a bit of careful widening because um, we don't want it to build up that back bow, as I mentioned before. So we might find this will just end up showing the same, but right now it feels, well, this is calling itself 74, 50. Okay, what have we got? What's the smallest one? Okay, that's showing 45 at a tightest grip, and this will probably show 50, yeah, 55, 45. So this is turning out already to be a little thicker. Now, I don't have, by default, immediately a larger one than that, but I do have other things that you can use. If I check the width of that, no, that's too thin. There are, do we have other blades around which will do it? So I'll worry about that after I've done this cleaning up, but that's an important thing to keep out for. So keep an eye out for. So I know that the new fret wire is slightly bigger on the tang than the old one. But the idea being that once this is down on top of here, we hope that the, um, the crown will cover. But as you can see up close, you can see that has to by, there's no way we can just push the new frets on top of that because it's crunchy. So we're going to always end up widening it very slightly, which is a pain. And I'm obviously I'm doing this in such a way as to try my best to avoid increasing the, uh, the sort of light colored part. Um, I mean, obviously if I scrape off some of this rucked up poly here, it will just flatten it out. It won't, by default, won't take it back to the wood straight away but it does have a sort of, it does give you that sort of slightly scuffed wider footprint for this. And we just have to do the best we can, but it is quite crunchy at, at the ends, the edges actually, I should say. And if we don't sand it back, the frets will try and sit up proud on it, which is, which is the downside of that method of attaching the frets, uh, sorry, uh, finishing. And there's no other way I can get this front in it. Actually, you can feel it coming up into a little peak. Of course, you could go over the top of this, but then you will have lost all of the 
you'll, you'll have to then sand everything back and rebuff it and you might as well be redoing the whole thing from scratch and in fact doing it the proper way around or the time consuming way around which is to um, do the whole of the fingerboard f first cut the slots and then put the frets on so you can see it's just gonna it's it's this natural kind of crinkle where it lifts up and it could be here quite a long time trying to soften off these bits that they fit now i'm thinking of the meantime i'm thinking where am i what blade am i going to use got a little hacksaw here which i think is actually whoops, of the width and i've got another big saw over there but i think the hacksaw may be light width actually it's going to be a bit wider it's too wide because it's got a curl to it I've got, I've got another blade somewhere around here that does it really well. I think it could be the, the full scale hacksaw actually. It's a bit unwieldy. Let me just check. Don't mind if it's a bit unwieldy as long as it does what I need. See that goes to, that's a little bit big too, that goes to 70. There is another one. I've got one. I've got one. Under my skin. One of these little, might be one of these little things. I've got, uh, I've got, right, I've got this one. One of these comes in at 60. I remember it. I've used it before. There's, there's really many, many hacksaw blades here. It's just a matter of getting the one that comes in at 50, just to widen it slightly. So what's this one at? There you go. That's 50. So that one, believe it or not, will. Will increase the size. It's a bit fiddly to use, but pullable. <laughs> so we'll just widen this up a little bit to begin with. It's actually quite hard to handle because you don't have much to hold on to. But there's a there's a widened. There you go, widened. And let's see how that likes it. There you go, much happier. That will go, that will tap in quite nicely. So that's how it would look. Whoops, that was how it will look once it's, uh, you can still see that little shine where the original poly tries to ride up onto the side of the fret. Um, like I say, we can't really do away with that and we'll do our best. Anyway, so I think what I'm gonna do is, I'm, this is gonna take so much boring slow time, I'm gonna stop and watch something on my thing. And I'll come back when this is done and I'm ready to um, press the frets in. See you in a bit. Hello, hello, hello. Here we are in the land of fretting. So I've got all my frets trimmed ready and I'm gonna line them up on the blue carpet and ready to pluck each one forth and glue it and press it into place. And I'm going to be wiping it with kitchen roll and then with a cloth and then more kitchen roll to clean up as we go so there are no nasty messes so there as all my frets lined up Ta -da. there is the neck here is my glue here is my big pile of kitchen roll bits here is my quality street tin with a wet cloth in it here is my bungee rope rubber that probably should come in handy uh, if it still works on here. <laughs> See if we can use it to pull down. Uh, let me just get a blade for the sticking on of the glue and we should be everywhere mostly ready I suppose. So let's begin with, let's just begin with, what should we begin with? Um, probably a some sort of long view that's not something like that let's begin with let's begin with this end the long end so i have each of these frets uh, i have ground with a thing so they're flat they're all undercut ready for some fills at the end of everything i've twisted all the fret uh tang ends i should say not fret ends tangs all the ends of the tangs i've twisted them straight because they, they tend to turn a little bit during cutting so now I'm just sluicing some glue into there and then we 
replace by hand the yonder fret wire slap bang in the center and I'm going to push my beautiful thing off to one side like so put this on there like that and just fit that on there it's a bit kind of loose to hold on to but I'm going to push down like so looks nice I'm going to swing on it like put the light down a bit now I don't quite know what I'm doing with this bungee rope thing so sort I of did have a way of working it before it was sort of like that yeah um and so what it meant was oh I get this a little prodder thing uh something like this no, that's a bit crappy all right we'll have that screwed over so I would typically and it's not there's no real reason for holding it down like that I'm just sort of wiping off the bulk of stuff but actually it probably makes more sense to just lift up now and clean it back up but the pull on the pull on the bar is a sort of way of getting a fairly standard um, Oops. get a fairly standard force into it so I'm, I'm not used to having the uh, camera there so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to Get me a single piece of this. I'm going to wipe it clean. Run it on the top, run it down the sides, and clear up any excess. And then I probably need to wring that out a little bit. Then a wet cloth run down like so around the ends. I'll probably just hang that off the top there. Probably makes more sense than anything else. I've got my dustbin, my bin right here ready so I can just chuck my leftover things straight in the bin. So there we have first of the frets pressed in and it looks great from this angle. Um, we've got a little bit to trim off the edges there. So we now go and oil up, oil up, glue up the second slot and it can be tempting to line up several in a go and then hop along and press them in. But I've found in the past that something happens in the sort of loss of focus slightly and you can have problems creep in. So as I go to the press now, I'm going to I'm going to just hold this through. I don't really need the um, don't need pad on the other end because you can just sort of line it up like so and to make sure it goes in and now I can give it a, a grab with the uh, this arm this bungee rubber and really it's just so I can take my hands off for a second and have to wipe along there get some of the goo out of the way and um, there's a little bit of a grub screw in here that sort of stops me skidding along very well so it's probably not the best cleanup and I can take that off again put it on there Move this. Just hit that again. A little bit clumsy, efficacious. Anyway, it's just a slow process, and that's really all I shall be doing for the rest of this evening. Um, as I just make sure each one of these goes in nicely, and then the important thing is to keep track as we go along and, and keep looking down at the. Uh, frets sort of looking long ways down the neck just to make sure that they're, they're all seating perfectly well down this way. I tend to sort of hold it up to the light and get a good look make sure they're sort of as centered as they can be. If it looks like something hasn't gone in properly at all then what we can do is we can just clean the stuff off there and we can give it another test squeeze in case we think it needs it there's no harm in that better that it seats properly this time give it a little swing and that feels fine again just clean off the top there all right and we're ready for the next one so i can keep you bored here let's have a look so see what you can see let me get the uh, that thing the mirror good old mirror let's see what you can see over there oh look there's me and there's the thing and there's the thing Something like that. It's not the most exciting shot in the world, but if I need you to be excited, I can hold the thing up close like that. 
And also, I need to spread these out a bit because they're hard to get. Um, what I might do is do a few more of these and they may just stick something on that I can listen to, which I was listening to before on the thing. And you can join me the next stage, which will be tomorrow, um, when I come to trim the fret ends. Once the frets are seated in place, um, next stage will be end beveling, which is a pretty scary process, but very important process of getting everything trimmed to the exact length, but also the exact end bevel. See, now I had originally had this loop on here to hold on to, didn't I? A bit of a crude system. So that's not a terribly effective way of lifting off stuff. Anyway, or I can just go like so and then drop it down and then it drops off completely. Not so clever. Anyway, that's how I do this. Slowly but surely. The main thing, obviously, being that everything seats as perfectly well as it can. Clean the ends up, clean the ends up, wet the ends, clean them up. They will fill a little bit here, so it may be difficult. Sometimes you can blow out the glue from under here to leave a gap, or you can dig it out later on. It's quite tricky. I don't think I've got any canned air with Oh, I have got the can there with a stick. I, I might just try this here because what you find out is you can end up, if you're not careful, you can you can end up with uh, the end gaps filled with glue when really what you want is um, a little space. So I've got a little bit of a chance there. It sort of spreads it around a bit, but if better if I just leave enough of a gap if I can for the um yeah to fill later on so there's a little tiny gap showing see what I mean so it's just for the for the want of a bit of blowy air so um yeah I'll just oh, that's fab that's just perfect so drip a great big blob onto there which you don't need and it's interesting that Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that this, this, this causes the, it's causing the fingerboard to, the, sorry, the finish to ruffle a little bit. So there's nothing I can do about that. That's not ideal. That's the problem of refretting on top of something like this. Um, I'm not best thrilled with that. It's the pressing down of the crown is just pushing the finish out of the way. That's not so good. How am I going to avoid that? I mean, we could cut in along the edge there if I had to, but... <sighs> Would it really make any difference? No, I just... Doesn't really make any difference. That's potentially going to come away over time. So that's something that's that's why I don't like the way they fret these things. Or sorry, the way they do the finishing, because I can't fret over the top of this without it pushing back. This, no matter what I do, this is sticking up, waiting to be pushed back. That's crap. I don't like it. And really, the only, truthfully, the only way around this would be to completely re refinish this whole neck. I mean, I can try and flatten out this stuff so it doesn't catch, but it just, you end up cutting further outside by definition. It's not brilliant, I'm afraid. Uh, I mean, it won't do anything right now, but it, it's just a consequence. It's it's the it's a combination of probably some slight adhesion problem, but it's mainly the cheap 
choice of the fretting method, the finishing method that they do, where they chose to finish over the frets. You wouldn't get this same problem if they'd finished onto the surface first and then push the frets in over the top. I'm annoyed with this because that's going to be a... I'm just going to not press so hard, but even that won't really save us from anything. trying my best to get this edge away from being touched or pressed or pushed by the, the new crown because it's that is what is pushing it back and causing that bit of a rough rough roughing ruffling it's just so much the wrong way to do it it's the reason they do it this way in the first place is because it's cheaper and it's, you know, it's a simpler way to do things. They don't spend time and money. And the reason being is if you do it the other way, you do the finish your fingerboard first and then press your frets onto the polished fingerboard. Um, you are, I don't know what this now. You are, um, you have to, as, you, as you're as you refinishing, or as you're doing the finishing, you have to clean up, um, re-cut every fret as you go so after each series of a few coats you have to dig out the, the, the slot to make sure that it um, uh, make sure that it make sure that it doesn't fill with finish and then at the end of it you can uh, buff it all to a very smooth finish and then then you fret over the top of that and so your frets are going in on top of very smooth uh, poly for example or nitro whatever you use but here it's it's coming up against this wall where it drops down from thick finish to wood because it never the thick finish or the finish never continued onwards it rose up over the side of the frets but it, of course is so much quicker to do it the cheap way and that's why it doesn't it, it, it creates problems for refretting as you can see a sort of ruffling no real way around that now it's it's pressed up against that cut edge of the finish i'm just trying my best to make sure everything else is as smooth and will not get pushed but the more the more you work it the more of course you you end up having to scuff the surrounding board because you can't can't soften back that edge of poly without um, further widening the sanded patch. It just depends on what's the critical factor here. Is it ensuring that this stuff doesn't pucker and break off? Or is it ensuring that it looks as pretty as it can be? It's, it's, it's a very thick edge that you come across. <laughs> so there's only two ways to do it really and the other way takes longer um, and yeah it takes longer and time is money and that's all there is to it. I mean, nobody's gonna fewer people are going to put that amount of time and effort into it if it <coughs> you know if it impacts into the bottom line which of course it does. So you can't blame them. Everybody's struggling to make their thing profitable and uh, you know there will come a point where somebody says we've got to save we've got to economize somewhere in this production line and somebody will say I know why don't we not fit the nut why don't we just stick a nut in there and let the let the player adjust it so we'll, we'll set it with really high first fret action we won't care about how unplayable it is but they'll still buy it and we'll we'll sell it to them and then they'll take it home and go to a luthier and luthier will spend an hour getting it right and they'll truthfully they will have tried one way and they will have seen that 
probably the same number of people go ahead and buy the one with the crap nut as buy one with a better nut and some bright spark will look at it and go if they're going to buy it anyway why are we wasting time and money wasting our profits getting it so perfect when nobody really well not nobody notices but nobody they've proved that they're not going to stop buying our guitars just because we didn't do this or that and the same really applies with uh, this finishing of the fingerboard nobody has stopped nobody stopped buying Fender guitars because Fender did their fingerboard this way um, so why would why would you if you were Fender why would you spend a load of money to do it some sort of notionally wonderful way just because you thought it was a much better way of doing it and made you feel good somebody's saying yeah but the bottom line Sam the dollars you go oh yeah that's right I could have a, a new yacht sorry a yacht or a new yacht if I were just if I just agreed to do the spray over the frets technique I could make save a million bucks a year and then I could have I retire early or I could take a, a big dividend this year. Sounds, it starts to sound attractive, eh? When you put it like that. Okay, well, let's have a quick look down here. Down the line. Yeah, it's looking good. Yeah, we just have to live with this bit of pushy puckering stuff, I'm afraid. It's, it's down to it's probably down to it whether there's any separation. Remember I talked about the finish kind of going over like a carpet and when you pull the fret away, it breaks the carpet by, by definition. You can't pull the fret without pulling up bits of the carpet. Well, it's probably done that and that's what's caused it to lift up a little bit and then pressing on top of it just caused it to ruffle, crumple. Like I said, though, it wouldn't have done it that way if they had fretted, uh, finished it the preferred way in the first place. But we know who they want. So, I, w I think in my own time, the only time I've ever overspray frets is when something in a setup situation has gone wrong to the point where I've had to uh, finish, re-finish re the guitar fingerboard for a customer and it's just a you know we need to do a quick way we don't need to go and strip the entire thing back and redo it all from scratch because it just become suddenly very expensive so as a as a relatively inexpensive get out of jail it's doable it's you know Fender's been doing it for decades I suppose but So we will just plod on. Now I will change, I have to change the tip of my neck call upside down in a minute as we move out of the solid heel supported bit for pressing on and then we'll get it supported by the cork call, which we have to be very careful of. I've been caught in the past because you can sometimes, you can sometimes um, what's the word? press, get the wood of the neck pressed into the, wood on, on the core because there are parts where the cork has worn out a bit over the years and doesn't retain all of its fabulous um, springiness and uh, and then what happens is you press down and it presses the neck into the wooden bit there and you can cause compression marks which you don't want to do This little tube can of air has come in handy on this because it gets a bit difficult to pick that clean later on. So just puffing it and getting the clearing the ends of it now is a better way of doing it. Right, so now I'm gonna switch this over and use the cork support like so. And on we go. 
So I don't know how long this, I didn't time this, I can't remember now how long this takes, um, but it's not the longest thing in the world. What can we see down there? Boring, <laughs> everything's boring now. Um, so we put this in here now. So we come all the way up here, which is just about reachable. I probably should have done another one the other way. So this is, this is where you can run the risk of just pushing the neck onto there. That's just about okay, didn't touch it, but you have to be very careful. Yeah, so just, I think, I think it's good to explain some of the constraints of fretting um, because I think sometimes people don't think it or think it can be done without there being any sort of damage at all. And sometimes the, the, due to things that are outside of my control, like how it was uh, originally finished, for example, I, you know, there can be things I, I can't control that end up you know, like bits of sometimes bits of finished chipping off just because that's what it's going to do if you remove old frets so that I always have to say it is not guaranteed that these frets will all go in perfectly without doing some small amounts of damage along the way it is a sort of destructive process and obviously what I'll do to the best of my ability is if there is some issue and finish flakes off then I do my very best to um, touch it up and bring it back to its kind of glory and actually what's quite nice is that with poly um, it's really easy not easy relatively easy to use waterborne uh, wipe on poly to do these kinds of repairs when as and when necessary um, and so it's, it's very flexible and you can use it really well by hand and work it so you, instead of having thinking of having to spray if we if we for example when the when I do the fret end beveling if for example um, it scuffs which it almost certainly will scuffs some of the uh, edge um, then it's, we can we can um, just build it up very slightly with some um, wipe on poly hand applied. And so that can be done at home in sort of comfortable conditions, you know, watching something on YouTube with a cup of tea, you know, uh, it's a slow process, but it's nice and controlled. Okay, so I'm keeping my little overhangs clear, which is good. So I'm clearing them out one at a time as we go along. So this will now sit until tomorrow. Um, I did the thing, just to remind you, the thing I widened the slots with happened to be, in the end, the coping saw, um, which, of which I've got a couple, but they're both the same diameter with 50 mil, half a mil, 0.5 of a mil thickness, um, which is just perfect for widening this up. Um, so, it, you know, the thing is, you could buy dozens of luthier saws, which is not a dime saw, luthier saws, um, you know, one for each tenth of a millimeter tang thickness, and it would end up costing you a lot of money. Or you can use something, once you've, you know, if you've made the original uh, slot with a good saw, which is controllable and, and you know, it's sort of a bit easier to manage um, and then you know after that you're really just widening it to the required width and there's no real reason why that can't be a band a bandsaw no a hacksaw blade or a coping saw blade or whatever you have that's the right thickness that's all that matters is you just widen the slot a little bit so Yeah, so don't, don't 
don't be too precious. Many things are usable to get the job done. I've just gone and squeezed up some more glue into the slot end, which I don't want. So let's just clear that up. Ah, yes. Somebody brought me a, a Victorian, I think it's Victorian looking, well, a very old banjo, early 20th century banjo, if, if not Victorian, but um, very interesting to see. And they want it cleaned up a little bit. I don't think it's wanted for serious playing and it, it has a quite a baggy um, skin on it, which I don't know whether that feels, it feels to me like that can be might be the result of it sitting in uh, sitting in the oh shit, I can see I didn't even go in sitting in the attic for too long in the damp attic so I think that's a that may well be either something that needs replacing or drying out for kind of assessing whether it's got a playing life ahead of it but structurally it seems to be all there um, and it's one of those things that I don't have a lot of experience working on banjos at all. I've done one or two in most of my life. Um, I worked on two, but it's the kind of thing that I look at and go, okay, what does the customer want? They want it uh, refurbishing slightly. So it's, uh, see, I've got this one here. This is, this is a fraction under cut, but I'll leave it. It's got a tiny bit of, it's almost the metal almost comes to the end there, which is a fraction more tang than I might have wanted. But it's kind of, you either pull it out and start again, or you, you accept that that one, the metal will just come to the surface there. I don't think it's the end of the weld. It's quite hard to calculate exactly where what you don't want is to have too great a tang undercut because then you've got this flying bit of um, metal on the end um, and the, the more of that that flies the less likely it is to sit flat which is exactly the most thing you don't want or the thing you most don't want if you get what I mean. so I would rather occasionally have situation where if, you know when we beveled it back we've got a little bit of you know, the fret is showing the tang is showing um, rather than having it too long and have the crown flying overhead so many little things you would never think of if you hadn't done it before or if you'd never thought it through or tried to do it Now, I can promise you something that you will never, even however good this looks, this will never be 100% level in, in that. It always will need a little bit of fret leveling because the tolerances are so minuscule when we set a very low action that the frets have to be incredibly level. And um, they just aren't when they're pressed in. It's simple as that. There are mechanical factors, um, how hard you press, maybe a tiny piece of grit on the surface, stopping it seating. And even that amount of difference is enough to, uh, to make a fret show up as very slightly uneven. Um, so I expect every time I do a refret, I absolutely expect to do fret leveling afterwards as well. I think probably one in 25 or 30 in my estimation in the past has not required it. In other words, it's been so good that it was just playable straight from the off. It's very rare for that to be the case. Um, that was good. It's all fitting lovely. It's fitting lovely. Um, but yeah, so I don't feel at all bad. And if you ever get into in fretting, 
equally don't you be disappointed if you find that you're you do your fretting like this you put your rocker on the next day or you, you know, yeah put your rocker on to see how how level they all are and you've got lots of rocking and clicking and clattering it's absolutely nothing to be worried about it's completely par for the course and the fact is none of the manufacturers even get it perfect because and you can tell that because when you get new guitars from the manufacturer lo and behold they uh the, um, you can immediately find rocking frets and have to take care of them yourself. So, and that's because the process is by definition quite crude and, you know, lots of variables involved and not at all scientific. Oh, I was going to just give that a press down a minute. Things in the way. Thank you. Blow, blow the man down. So leaving these little gaps at the end as clear as much as I possibly can means that I'll be able to fill them with a little bit of, uh, could it, it could be super glue if I had nothing else, but I could do it with a little bit of putty or wood filler. Uh, it's actually quite difficult. It's, it's even more difficult than it sounds to do that because the, the stuff, material putty stuff and wood filler just tends not to want to go into a tiny hole. It tends to want a bigger, need a bigger gap to grip. And if you put it into a very tiny little aperture like the fret end gap, um, it, it, it often just doesn't have any anchor so that when you come to, I and mean, perhaps you, you know, scrape it back or sand it, it can just easily pull out because it's not really purchasing on anything. So again, one of those things, it's just not as easy as you would think it would be. All is going pretty well. So I'm nearly there. One, two, three, four, five to go. And then we we'll place it for on the bench for overnight. Come back and end bevel the frets tomorrow when the glue's set. The glue is a backup means. It's not critical. Um, if you cut the slots right, or you match the slots with tang dimensions you should be able to press frets in and they just hold themselves by the tang but of course you know this is a refret and as I mentioned earlier on that's why the so-called repair wire exists because um, it, you know people know that when you refret it may be that the frets don't fit quite as the tang is going into a slightly loosened hole, um, in which case the repair wire has that extra thickness on the tang to help you grip. But I always like to have a little bit of glue back up. And for me, the wood glue is the preferred choice. Um, although if you're in a hurry, it, it's probably better to use, you can use super glue and then you can have the whole of the uh, end beveling done the same day and you know you can do the whole refret in a day it's quite intensive but labor intensive but you know the the, the super glue gives you that immediate thing but of course the reason i wouldn't use it on this is that it's very difficult to clean up on a maple thing even if you've got to hand you've got your uh debonder stuff it's very difficult to get it all up with even with debonder um, which kind of starts out by softening it rather than cleaning it up and then you've got to kind of soak everywhere and it's essentially a bit of a, a bit of a nightmare um, so 
maple boards for me are always done with tight bond because it's water based and you can just clean up and it looks great afterwards. The marks, the only marks we can see from this reefer is where I've obviously done the sanding to, to get down this crusty edges of these frets which is mostly work uh, only the, the couple at the end that it's puckered up the finish a bit but like I say that's that's courtesy of the finish not the refretting just imagine having a carpet laid the full length of this I'm going to cheat now I'm going to do the last three together imagine having a carpet laid the full length of this neck over all the frets and then you basically it sticks, glues to all the frets and to the fingerboard. And then you come along and you, you, well, first of all, you, uh, you come along and you sand over the top of that nice carpet until it breaks. So now you've got the carpet sticking to the fretboard, hopefully, and um, the sides only of the frets. Um, you've got the clean break at the top of the frets. And then later on, you come and pull those frets out and lo and behold, surprise, surprise, the, um, the rest of the, uh, the material, the rest of the carpet starts to fall apart. That's the problem. So this is the difficult to reach bit here. So. Big clean up. Very hard to soak up this excess on the ends because you've got these metal, spiky metal bits sticking out, catching your your uh, kitchen roll or cloth. Anyway, I've been absolutely enjoying the freedom of having a car that starts. <laughs> I never take those kinds of things for granted anymore. Um, but once you've had a, a month or so having to sort of rely on a, a pump starty thing, power block, because you couldn't find anyone to work out what was going wrong, um, uh, I've ended up with uh, a different garage for getting a sort of second opinion and having the, the, the second garage being able to determine what the first didn't. And it's a sort of funny, situ tricky situation because uh, I've you know, been happy with the service of the first garage throughout the years. Um, and they're they're decent people and they've tried very hard to do do right by us um, and often they've done little things for free they, they, they checked the battery and the charging system for me and fitted a new bulb for free and you know I, I, it makes me want to continue using them but they got this one slightly wrong so now I've got the battery they sold me which was dud um, I now have that and a new readout to go back to them probably tomorrow um, and say, look, this is not right. Can you know it must be under warranty? Can you can you get the money back for it and refund me, please? Because I couldn't afford really to waste that much money. Okay, so we are done. New frets on. Um, I mean, we could probably some of the some of the light sanding marks. We could probably put that on the buffing wheel if, if I wanted to. But um, I'm worried about the break in the finish, and I don't want to aggravate it anywhere. We'll see 
what happens um, when we bevel with the ends of the frets back. But there we are, a nice set of frets done. Look at that. So you can see uh, in the gl glittering light, you see the little bit of puckering there, it's like plastic wrapping just to the right of those frets. Uh, perhaps the third one in and the fourth one there, the third one in. It's a little bit of blistery sort of, maybe maybe it's not, maybe I'm just, I'm seeing it. But it, it feels to me like a little bit of blistering. But what you can also see there is a little bit of sanding uh, spread where I uh, had to sand to get the ledge down. So you can see it's, it was never, that was the original um, the way the finish looked there with those kind of little cliffs so it never seemed uh, it didn't it never fitted smoothly because of the way it went up and over the fret so just a you know and there you can see where I've, I've had to where's my finger you see where I've had to sand wider to get rid of a kind of big clump of the finish but it'll be fine and with a little bit of polish in there or even you know light buffer that will work out fine Anyway, so there we have it, done for tonight. I'm going to go home and get myself a pizza or something. Ooh, nice shiny things. All good, all fitted, all waiting for... That's a nice glossy looking shot, isn't it? Get my dirty finger out of it. There you go. The money shot. Right, I don't like that expression. It's a bit gross. Anyway, um, I'm going to tidy up, but thanks for watching. See you later. Hello, everyone. Back, oh, where's my mirror? Back again. Sorry, I shouldn't shout. Back again to continue on this rainy Wednesday night to continue the work of the possessed. So, overnight, frets have glued, glued as glue. Now I'm coming along with my sharp nose, what's it? And I'm just snipping off any overhang and uh, this is quite good because I can get pretty close to the edge here down by the river for those prog rock fans close to the edge and um, the less we have to grind away with the thing <laughs> the end beveling block the better so even if you don't take much off this extra little snip off is is better than nothing. So I've had an interesting day already so far today. My my home work, as I tend to do loads of social media, buying parts, talking to customers at home during the day, and work up here in the evening on guitars. And today I've had been working on a vintage banjo. Um, and uh, just now taken delivery of a, an ancient Spanish Spanish guitar, ancient Spanish classical guitar, um, 1970, I think made in Cadiz, Cadiz. Um, anyway, it's a tired thing and it's got considerable bellying on the top along with um, the bridge lifting. So I'm just having a little look, see, I'm not, I'm very nervous. I'm not a great fan of this idea of steaming guitar tops with aluminium clamps and stuff. And I know that, okay, here we've got a guitar that's probably may have some financial value as an old quality made proper Spanish guitar, um, or it may not, but it certainly has uh, some sentimental value to the owner who's currently going through chemotherapy at the moment um, and wants to play this perhaps sometime in the near future when he's feeling better. So um, I sort of had a good look at it and the first thing that struck me was well you know Alethea might take the take this here I hope I can see what am I what am I pointing you at? Alethea might you know pull the We'll take off the bridge, attempt to flatten the bellying out, and then um, put back bridge and 
with, with bellying corrected, hopefully. Um, and like I say, I'm not a million percent confident about that sort of process. But so I'm kind of having a think, and I wanted to do a bit of research. First of all, to see what people traditionally do when they steam tops that have been progressively deformed over time by spring loading predominantly. Um, so I'm going to have a, a look at that. Um, but I also was kind of interested to know whether uh, anyone had ever really used bridge doctor system, or the JLB system, bridge system. The doctor is a different device. But anyway, so I was kind of interested in seeing whether that had been used before. An initial bit of research um, before I left as a building um, suggested I'm so uptight that I've lost my little brush. I just, it's gone. Like one of those many, several splendid, many splendid and wonderful things that just vanish. Now, there are many who would, who would say, yes, they vanish then because they're under your junk on this or that desk. It could be the case, but my little fret dust brush is gone, so I'm going to have to use something that will do, but just isn't the usual one. So I'm using the old Colombo fingerprinting thing. Where did it go? I'm, I know I'm probably just looking at it head on and I just can't see it. Anyway, uh, yeah, so interesting, some differences of opinion. Um, and of course, when you have luthiers expressing differences of opinion, they tend to come with insult, bizarrely. Sadly, actually. The warmth of that heats that up. Uh, yeah, they often come with unkind, judgmental type of insults. So one person expresses their experience of having used a bridge system in a particular guitar of theirs and said, for them, it's worked out really well. And another person has, uh, Luthier has jumped in, I'm a Luthier, and then you're, you're talking nonsense, and so on and so on. So you don't really ever get to the bottom of it because the debate in the commas stops being constructed around about that point, um, which is a real shame. Anyway, so I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's just a case of you know adding up alternatives and possibilities, really. Um, so that the owner has some options to spend couple of hundred quid or more, probably more, on having the bridge removed, the top steamed flat if possible, extra bracing put in. I mean, who knows really what it would require to make it, uh, to make it have an impact on the action. Or do you look at a, a less de destructive in the short term method of using a bridge doctor? You know, and the question is, the, the Luthier, Luthier's objection was heavily centred around, uh, sounded to me like, you know, the loss of uh, sonic projection as a result of introducing this solid thing post, or something that dampens the top, or takes away some of the vibration. So, you know, their argument was, um, that therefore loses sound projection or loses, diminishes the ability of the top to make a good sound. And, um, well, you know, that may, may be some truth in that. I don't know. Sounds fairly logical. Um, but then you just have to say to yourself, what is the customer looking for? You know, when you're presented with an action that's too high to play, are they looking for exactly the same fraction down to a percentage fraction of a percent of decibels from their guitar or are they looking for a playable guitar when they come out of the chemo treatment and just want to relax you know are they concert uh, classical concert performers 
or are they ordinary folks at home? So difficult really. Um, so I'm going to continue doing some more research into this. So I'm quite pleased at the moment. I'm getting down to a good smooth level here without any scraping going down the side, which is rare. Um, anyway, so that was that was uh, later on this afternoon, the arrival of the uh, classical guitar. So that's that, and on the on the banjo, it was interesting to um, make an adjustment to the action. It was a it is a banjo and in fact one of the cheapest types you could ever buy it's called a melody joe and um, consequently it seems to be the simplest type as well so it has no neck action sorry no action adjusting um, parts rods where the more expensive more professional uh, ones seem to have rods that uh, allow you to change the action but this doesn't so I had a very good look all around it to see if there was anything about it that was adjustable um, in fact it just seemed to be that there was no way to adjust it other than uh, by putting a shim into the neck before retightening it which I've done using a piece of cream plastic it's like a bendy piece of cream plastic, but actually quite looks like it is. Um, and that has successfully changed the action. Um, you know, it's, it's not ideal, but it's not ideal in the same way that, uh, you know, it's not ideal to reduce the action on most acoustic guitars by taking down the saddle. That isn't really what you'd want to do because it changes the... Uh, Amount of down force of the strings on the saddle, which will have some impact on the sound projection of the guitar. So, so often things are less than perfectly ideal. And um, anyway, so we shall see. So I've ordered a new bridge, so I can modify it, make it slightly, what's the word, shorter, because with new lower action tall bridge won't work. Um, so I'm going to yeah, put some new strings and new bridge and I think I'll just see how it plays, get it cleaned up and set it back up and see what we've got. As always, when I'm using this most deadly files, you can see that I'm pressing down with my left hand to absolutely ensure that this file doesn't skip up and across the top of the frets, which would be a fair old disaster. Um, so, just getting rid of the bits. So we're nearly there. Again, a little bit of, I think there's a little bit of glue residue sticking out the end, but there's a little naturally chipped off piece. Noticed. Just trimming at this point again. I posted something on my just clipping the edge of the oh no, that's okay. Posted something on my own personal Facebook today, not Real Love Guitars, but I saw a really inspiring video. Today is a Ukrainian Remember the Armed Forces Heroes Day or something. I forgot the exact name of it. Um, but Zelensky released a video of him himself walking from the president's office. Now I know somewhere in the background there will be some army stock secret service. The man has a bounty on his head and had 
numerous uh, assassination attempts on him. And no, you know full well that Putin will stop at nothing to whack him, rub him out. Um, but despite all of that, he walked pretty much naturally down the road to uh, in the snow with a red sun, cold looking sunset behind him. And uh, as he went down the road, some people, kind of people walking home from work by the looks of it, or to work, walked past him and wished him sort of spot, realized who he was at the last minute. Because obviously he's not announced this to anybody in the public for safety. But to hear him talk, a very inspiring talk, but also uh, to see him interacting with these surprised but very charmed people who got to see him for a moment and speak to him. It was very, very heartwarming. Just beautifully natural. And I wrote on my Facebook, like, my arguments, I don't care for all, you know, as soon as you mention something like that, you get a whole load of conspiracy theorists telling you, you know, um, Zelensky's, you know, an F CIA stooge puppet, la de la and then before you know it, everybody's insulting everyone. I don't care about that. My instincts and everything I trust in and that has kept me safe throughout my life so far tells me that he's a, he's a decent human being and, and that seeing him being a decent human being is actually very inspiring and encouraging. And whether he intended to be, to put himself so much in the line of fire to begin with when he was first in politics. I don't claim to even know and I don't think it's worth even arguing with that. So maybe he was a good time president to begin with, but what's true is he's conducted himself in a way that requires, demonstrates an enormous amount of courage and humanity, I think. And for that, I, my spirit warms to the man, and, and, ex and in exactly the way my spirit doesn't warm to those lizard-like Republican Speaker of the House, or whatever his name is, that guy who is currently connecting any chance of helping Ukraine to a, 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 like a hostage demand to outlaw abortion. So he's, he's, he's saddled helping Ukraine, made, it, made helping Ukraine conditional on him getting his way on his religious, ultra-orthodox, conservative stance on abortion. You know, I don't, I'm not even criticising or taking issue with his, his stance on abortion. He's entitled to have a view on it. Uh, and he's entitled to represent other people who share that view. But to to play with the future of democracy and freedom and the stability in, in the world, uh, to, to use Ukraine as this pawn in getting his other kind of power needs met to, to, to get elected by a particular constituency, uh, I think is pretty shameful. And, you know, all that intellectual rationalisation aside, when I just compare his dead, expressionless, quaffed, super American quaffed, plastic visage to the real person that I see in Zelensky, there's no comparison at all. I don't care what... I just literally don't care what conspiracy theorists believe, want to come up with, want to believe, um, or want to tell themselves. I know who I support. Anyway, so here I have the first set of um, rounding off done. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run up again now with the other file to just catch any little burrs that hang out uh, and stick out. So everything here is kind of rounding off the ends a little bit, which in some ways takes away its beautiful chiseled look. I've said this before, is that the softer you make it, by definition, the less chiseled and 
kind of high tech it, it looks. There's nothing like a series of perfectly dome shaped techno frets. But the tighter, the, the finer the line, the sharper the edge. Um, and so if you want it to be free of cutting, you've got to round it off one way or another and it literally takes away some of that beautiful high-tech look. But customers always want it to feel more, feel better more than they want it to look sci-fi. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just kind of taking off any little burrs. And then same applies again if you get a sand block, sanding block and you decide to go over these frets again with a sanding block, it, it makes them look nice and all uniform, but it puts a sort of cham uh, you know, chamfered edge back on them and they become a blade again, waiting to cut into the fingers. So you, at some point you've got to stop with a certain level of softness that's tolerable to the fingers. Oops. Anyway. I always think if I'm going to look down there, will I eventually find my brush? Probably not. So that's that side, starting to feel okay. The idea is I want to get it as smooth or as soft as I can before I do the precision fret level. And so that once I've done the precision fret leveling, for which I obviously have to refit the neck, put sacrificial strings on, put the bridge on and so on. Um, once I do the fret leveling part, um, then I can kind of soften off all the fret edges with the sandpaper as I go through. Uh, after recrowning, I get into sanding and polishing the frets. So I just then sort of bring the fret ends into that sanding and polishing regime and they get softened off even more. Um, you can do it with, uh, you can do it with, like you can sort of make a tube of sandpaper and run it up and down but kind of a little bit more difficult on a what do you call it this thing maple board because you have to mask it off first we're gonna to have to mask it off at some point to sand everything following the fret leveling um, so we always have that risk with sanding sorry with um, masking is there's always a risk that the masking tape is going to lift off some finish that's just waiting to fall off here and um, no real way went around it. But as it's looking at the moment, um, technically I could do away without having to do any poly work on the edges of this. Um, the next question is, can I fill these fret ends satisfactorily, at least the ones that are sort of showing as little dark fret ends. Some of them most of them are there, some of them occasional one, not on this side actually, but on the top side, there's the occasional one where the metal goes right to the edge, but that's that. Um, so the question is, what do I use? Now I've got, I've got a fair bit of dust here. I, what I don't want to do is go near this with stuff that I can't wash off. So the last thing I really want to do is attack or do anything on this edge that requires super glue. Um, because even if you've got a very liquidy super glue um, you've still got to come back and scrape it back so it's far better that it was a sort of water-based paste so some people would say well can you do it with um, can you can you get some we've got some nice mapley type dust there can we can we make up some glue based water-based glue stuff which which theoretically should mean that we can clean out everything easier. <laughs> um, now what I don't have straight away is that for anything really very very sharp to dig out. So I think to have lost. How come I've lost things? Where have things gone? Uh, I think we lost the blade. Maybe the blade was over here for some reason. Maybe it was maybe it wasn't here it is. On its side hiding out of the way. Sorry about the the view it's terrible I'm just useless so what I'm thinking of is we check each of these little gaps you know we need we need there to be room to get something in there so I'm just going through and digging gently digging out anything that's in the way so we could see that we can get some goo in there and if we can ideally it would be nice if it was a little bit of 
wood glue and powder. Um, in some ways you could say, well, a bit of a bit of super glue and powder would be good because then that would sort of go underneath the frets and wickets way down, but we don't really need that, so and this one is just slightly proud. I'm going to do slightly something else here, just to hold fire. This one is just a trifle proud of there. That's not what we want. So what I'll do, because we've just re reshaped that slightly, I'm just going to go back in and round it off, followed by this. Yeah, anyway, so although super glue is very tempting, because what I really want is something that will just dry quickly now and be done so I can move on. I've got some putty, some JB Weld putty here, uh, which I could use, but even using that, it takes about 24 hours to really dry solid. It's good stuff, but you have to have patience with it. So um, I would rather something I could sort of get into here and perhaps dry a little bit, sort of tacky dry it with uh, maybe a bit of warm air. And I'm thinking, okay, that glue is probably a good idea. Whoops, this glue is a good idea. So let's borrow half of this stuff for a minute. We don't need too much. Let's let's do a, a sticky mix. I don't know about balances of anything. I've just guessed it. Guessed it. We'll see. We want it. I mean, I don't think we've actually got any um, professionally made up stuff. Uh, yeah, no wood filler. So I kind of go for a bit of homemade stuff, mixture of wood dust and glue. So I think that's a fraction too dry. So a little bit more in. A bit like cake, cake mixings. You don't need much more at any one time. Now this stick is going to turn out to be too weak and it will break. So that will be the test I suppose. Now that's that's starting to be quite pasty already. So or it is quite pasty. So the question is can we work with that to begin with? So let us Get our thing down. Let's zoom out a bit. Sorry, I'm not really doing a very good job of thinking about the audience as people who needs entertaining. So let's try with the little thing scalpel here. So here we have a little bit that I can press in there, and the good part, as, as you know, is I can wipe away the remainder. Um, some of it will take hardly any at all because it's the tang is almost to the edge. So actually this is sort of looking quite quick but the question is how long will it stay in. Now the good thing about putting more finish along the edge um, should it need it is of course it would seal in any um, any of this glue and wood dust mixture so kind of trapping it in there sanding it back first and then going over with some uh, with some finish is kind of satisfying because you end up with a, the end fills sort of as part of the finish um, but it's a long-winded thing because I've got to add a, a, a another day of uh, home hand finishing with that stuff Wipe on Polly. Wipe on Polly. Good friend of mine. Now this is a horrible feeling that this might be just on the sharp side there, but see the great thing about this scalpel is it really finds the if we've got anything that's too close to the edge or needs a, a fraction more cutting it will find it. So I'm just Walking my way along, filling in uh, the little end bits. And to, truth to tell us, if they dry nicely like that, then there's no real reason we have to go over them if we don't need it. My concern is, I, as I'm doing this, I can just just feel a little bit of steel. So I've got a tiny bit more 
of finishing I could do there, so I may have to undo what I've just did, did, done. Um, so there's a couple of ways of thinking about this. If I get a piece, piece of, some pieces of this stuff, maybe I'll just wipe it along, and if, if I'm not happy, if I think there's edges that are requiring further treatment, I may just further treatment them right where we stand. So there's a sort of quick whiz down, followed by scraping out anything in the way. I'm, I'm thinking there's a possible hint of needing a little bit more edging down here. So, whoops, I forgot where I put all the rest of my dust. Never mind, I'll make some more. Doesn't do to have it all kicking around here, getting in the way. So let me just uh, clamp this down one more time, just to make sure. Now I'm just going to go down into the, as flat as I can, to the body here, bulk it in there, just to make sure. Just a little editing, I would call it, of what we've already done. So now's the time to do it if it needs that. See, even the end fills now still stay filled, which is quite good. Um, and then I can sort of just rub them down and they stay filled. Um, let's do the other side, but let's first of all just make sure everything is exactly as right as it can be. We don't want to run into any more. That's fine. Just to be on the safe side. Okay. So we've done the top edge. And we can come back now to the bottom edge. So some of the tangs, as I've mentioned, come all the way to the end so they won't really fill up at all and they will just look like metal unfortunately. And that was, that was my slight mistake on one or two lengths of the undercut. In other words, not enough. But the, the look of it won't really care as long as it's everything that needs to be filled is filled and there aren't gaping holes really, that's the main thing. So, here we are. So I just uh, wrote to Taylor Netherlands today with all the details for Rich's uh, Taylor GS Mini, which I've got for a reduction in action. And it's interesting how this works because um, Taylor have, I don't know if they've just changed how they do it or whether the, you know, I've done something in the right order or whatever, but um, when you first start looking to do setups and stuff, it, one of the things you kind of learn is that, uh, oh yes, these tailors, they have a, uh, a bolt-on neck system. Oh, I see, what's that for? Oh, well, it allows you to blah, blah, blah. And what you quite quickly learn is that the best way, or the way you should, are supposed to set up a tailor or change the action on a tailor is not via the saddle, which you may be used to doing on everyone else's brands of acoustic guitars because often there's no alternative way for you to do it um, but with a tailor it's designed so you can um, well they design it to make the neck easy to remove and as a result you can uh, you make action adjustments via the um, via uh, effectively a neck reset um, where your 
um, the, the, what's the word? This this about avowed of the idea of doing it via the um, via the saddle, which many of us on our own guitars over the years, or or on customer guitars when there's no alternative, have had to have done it do it that way, have to have done it that way. Anyway, so then you realise that with its bolt on neck, the tailor system is very good because because it's meant to be adjusted and it's made easy to adjust, then suddenly you've got, you realize you've got a guitar or a brand of guitars that can be made, uh, corrected every time they need to be. And of course, that only becomes meaningful when you've worked or been around enough, worked on or been around enough guitars to realize that actually all these guitars are destined to be, um, to, to deform. Um, and I think until you, I think, I think until you've been around, worked on them a lot, or you've been around a lot of acoustic guitars, that idea that the acoustic guitar is doomed to this permanent state of def deformation is it's just, it's alien. It's just, who's, who's, it can't possibly that be that they make guitars like that and, you know, um, doomed to deform from the minute you buy them. But then eventually you realise it's true. And then suddenly the fact that Taylor has their guitar or designs their guitars with the bolt on neck and the, better yet the incredible shimming system for changing the neck angle then you sort of realize what a monstrously big advantage that is over the rest and I've always said that I think Taylor undersells that to the average Joe. Now to be honest People defend me and go, oh, so look, they point me to a Taylor website where, you know, that a page says, Taylor's patented bolt on neck system allows you to blah, 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 blah. And of course it says that. Well, that's not the point I was making. The point I was making is I don't think they shout about it the way they ought to, given the importance of what their system permits. So when you been through a few guitars and they all slowly deform that shape and the action rises to a point where somebody like me says to you, oh I'm sorry it's reached, it's reached a point of neck reset. It's either neck reset or that's the end of things for you. It's a horrible thing to hear. Uh, and then it's when you've had that a few times that you realise that, oh my god, the Taylor system allows me to continually fix or reset the action, so it's anticipating the fact that it will wear that way over time, or it will deform that way over time. And so, you suddenly realize what an absolutely brilliant thing it is, and you want to tell everyone about it, because it suddenly becomes the first guitar I can imagine having for life, because of that, precisely because of that factor. And I just think that is such an importantly big realization or difference it should be yelled about from the rooftops. Anyway, so I just think they, they should leave it to me. I'll promote it more and more because I think it's just a brilliant system. So. Running out of batteries. Anyway, so. That's the good thing about the Taylor. Um, so, so, as I say, for some reason Taylor, Taylor allowed me to get shims from them. They, they sort of, sorry about it, it's a bit noisy. They, in my experience, they seem to give off the, almost like a, an implicit, Implicit, not explicit. An implicit message that only people trained in their system can access these shims. Uh, but then there comes a point where if you ask them nicely and you maybe convince them that you understand what you're doing, um, they seem to be suddenly very helpful. And they've since that point, they've been supplying me with shims. They, they do demand a certain number of things. For example, you have to give them the uh, 
the, the current playing action of the guitar, uh, the target action, the name and address of the owner so they can register it if it isn't registered, the serial number of the guitar, the model and all that sort of stuff. Um, and what they then do is send me back some uh, a set of shims, a selection of shims, pairs, um, which I can use to change the playing action on this guitar, on that guitar. So it's just turned out to be excellent. I'm very pleased with that level of service. Um, what am I looking for? I'm looking for a screwdriver. Um, now on this one, I'm just going to, oh blimey, I want to set this into effectively lock down and I have to use an unfamiliar type of screwdriver. Ooh, I'm not used to using something like this. It doesn't really doesn't this kind of screwdriver does not oh, fit. It's not really designed to be screwed in in this position. Damn. Not my favourite. Anyway, yeah. So the the, the Taylor shim the system they've, they've become very willing to give their shims to me and others I think um, and as a result it means I can make adjustments. I don't know how we're supposed to do this up by the way without seriously damaging the screw heads on this. There's no access to the screw and we have to be able to access it because we're supposed to be able to set the tremolo up using this <laughs> poor business. Anyway, um, I'll come back to that in a minute if it needs doing. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the Taylor system is very good and they are now very helpful in supplying the shims and in pairs and their system is so good that I can now make an adjustment um, like I did uh, on uh, Rich's GS Mini. Uh, I was able to use the spares that I've already built up because they send a variety and I tend to only use obviously a pair. So I get this builder for spares which is really handy, handy, handy. Um, so that, that's kind of pretty much done. I'm just waiting to give it a test play. I can't really play it because it's left-handed but I'm going to give it a test out and see how it does. Um, I could wait another week for the uh, the, what do you call it? A slightly different set to come in, um, but I'm quite happy. It's got a very nice low action at the moment. Um, it could almost be, to some people, fractionally too low, but in fact, there's not actually any negatives to the way it plays. So I'm going to either wait another week and get a very fractionally different setting, or uh, go with the one I've got. Of course, the, the other thing I can do is, if necessary, I can put a very tiny shim under the saddle just to lift that a tiny bit more, if so desired. So I'm just looking to uh, sand this new nut down. If I can find the right sanding device. It's got a bit dirty, really. Um, so on this now, back to the made in Mexico. The those beautiful big brass slotted uh, screws aren't ideal for reaching in and doing what I've got to do. And what I've got to do is to use them in the end to retune the tremolo to its correct floating position. Um, so it's something that, or whilst it's lovely to see them made in brass, it's actually made things a bit harder than it needs to be. It's hard enough with a Phillips or a cross-headed screw. Posi drive or whatever, um, Posi drive or Phillips, but it's even harder with a slotted thingy. So we are sort of wavering on the fit here. So I'm just going to do a tiny bit more sanding. So in order to take this uh, this refret forward now, what I'm going to do is fit the nut, the new nut. Um, is that seated? Let's have a look. It's a bit high on that side, so it's sitting in, still not quite fitting all the way down. Um, yeah, we'll just thin it down to it drops in perfectly, and then we'll also take off this. We need a, a 
curve slope on this, it's nine and a half inch, which this is already radius to nine and a half inches, but we'll just take this little tab off, which is not needed. And to do that, we're probably best off switching this out and doing it with Dremel to get close and then uh, scrape it to perfection. Um, anyway, yeah, so on this one now we're gonna we're gonna basically set it up and do the or do the geometric setup as I call it, which means putting the tuners on, hard tailing the bridge to begin with, because we don't need it fl flopping about all over the place. We just want it stable in hard tail mode. Um, and then setting the guitar up and using the strings and the set action or target action, set it up with the target action uh, with the neck relief being where we want it and the action being where we want it over the first and last frets and then we use that uh, setup to do the precision fret leveling and that's where these freshly laid frets get tamed into perfection because at the moment they're probably pretty close. Um, I think it was a fairly straight and simple um, a nice refret but there will be some small microscopic differences to sort out. So getting the nut right now, the new nut is an important critical part of this process. So here we go, sitting in beautifully. Now that's going to be too high to begin with. Um, I'm not too worried about that just a second. Just a couple of things we can do. I'm torn between sometimes taking it down uh, from the bottom or cutting down into the slots depending on how high it sits. The problem with cutting it down from a, from the bottom or thinning it from the bottom of course as you can see is this is uh, a curve um, and it's going to make that it's going to make things actually quite difficult to do. I have got some devices that I could painstakingly do this over time um, but it is a hard process. So when you're working with a curved base once you've got it to sit there nicely it's going to be so much easier if you probably concede on gluing it there and working the uh, slots down depending of course exactly where they fall at the moment because we'll, we'll see how much too tall it is in a second. So the next thing we want to do is we want to refit the tuners because they're going to be an integral part of our, our um, geometric setup because you can't do that without the tuners being in place. So I've kept them all in the same order on the bench. I'm going to go in like so and I can just give them a light setting with that and we'll just tighten up afterwards. They're all in very nice clean condition as it happens so we'll give them a polish over as we go. And then we've got the original strings that I kept to use as sacrificial strings and the reason I took time to straighten them all out uh, before I coil them and put them away, coil them, I straightened the very end bits out, um, is because I've got to get them up through the block again now to reuse them. Um, so that's going to be hardish work. Um, I'm, as I'm doing this I'm looking at the, uh, the finish on the neck and as I mentioned in my Facebook post there's a couple of little areas of scuff that fall just outside of the, um, the the fret crown area, and that's inevitable because I've had to I had to work with quite a big drop where it drops from that crunchy finish um, to bare wood, which is courtesy of the Fender way of doing things. And it it sounds like I mean, of course, it's very geeky when you you go into detail about why that's such a problematic. Um, process that they do. It's, it makes total sense for them because it's, in, it's relatively it's good cost saving for them. They get the guitar out the door in what looks like a great condition. Um, customers are happy and it's only somewhere down the line that customers realize, ah, it's not quite straightforward because now I've come to refret it or I've got my luthier to refret it and he's reporting difficulty fretting on top of this weird bumpy carpet that doesn't doesn't quite well has broken as soon as you lifted out the old frets so there comes with it a series of problems which are pretty nerdy to 
go into, but that's what my Facebook page is all about. Um, and as a result, what we've got in there at the moment are some, just some scuffs either side. Now, I could leave it those with some uh, my car polish and do it by hand. I might look at that right at the end. Uh, also, right at the end, I could uh, put this all over, um, you know, buff this just on the wheel, and it would probably clean, you know, shine up that stuff that's currently looking a little scuffed. But we shall see. Now, just while I'm at it, there's a there's a question at the moment hanging in the air about whether or not um, whether or not no, that's not the one I want. Uh, the question about whether or not I'm going to fit another string tree in this guitar. Um, when it, the way it was strung up before, it absolutely needed one on the G, and it may be possibly be because of the way it was. Uh, strung or the way the strings went onto the um, posts, tuner posts. So I'm going to I'm going to just hold off putting another hole in yet until such times I just widen this one out a little bit. The, the reason I just did that is that this tusk string tree uh, screws are a little bit thicker than uh, the original ones. So to avoid any risk of stripping the wood, it just makes sense to widen it and minim minimize that risk. So there we have it. Okay, that, that and the nut, anything tusk does yellow over time. Sometimes it gets a bit too yellow and it doesn't, it doesn't even depend on you smoking a cigarette front of it but if it does get too yellow you can always just very lightly sand it and it will go back to its original color it's a surface sort of finish now I'm going to hold the second string tree out of the way until we know whether or not we're going to use it if I can string it correctly in a different way um, to avoid having to put a second one in I will but if that G ends up needing a second one then it will get the second tree because um, Having a string going over the nut with not enough downforce to make it play properly is not a desirable state of affairs. So first of all, oh, let me just do something else and perhaps we should just cover this for a minute. Down at this end here, my aim as I do the setup is to deck this down as a solid, effectively hard tailed for the purposes of this setup part of things, what I call the geometric setup. And what I also want to do is make sure, before I do anything with it, I want to make sure anyway that the this saddle is sitting in the correct place. So the first thing is, if I get, put this down flat for a minute, if I get this and I look at where these, I'll use the other one, look at where these front individual screws are set, and these absolutely don't want to be pressed down. We don't want the plate being pushed forward on its little chamfered front edge. I don't think these were, but we'll just, I'm just going to take them out so that they're not, so I'll be absolutely sure. All right? um, and truthfully, what I want to do is I want to just see what happens as I take them out, and I want to stop. As soon as it touches that plate, I'm going to stop, and then take that one out, and forward, and stop, and so on. So what I'm doing is I'm just making sure that nothing here is pressing down on the front edge of this plate so as to restrict it. And it's really important and it's, it's an area of the tremolo that many people can not know about and therefore overlook um, and, and it's quite common for people to have the front edge of their tremolo pressed down and, the, and forcing the back up a little bit which is definitely not good so right right now i can see that all these saddles appear to be way too high um, as a result of what's happened in the past, so we don't want them sticking up that high unless they have to be, but I don't think they will. So for now I'm going to run all the strings back through, the sacrificial strings that we're going to throw away after this, and I, as I go to set the ideal target action, we may well then find that uh, the, um, the saddles need to be in a different place altogether. So when you set the tremolo, which we won't do until the end of the 
geometric setup part of things. When you set up a tremolo, you're going to set it in one of three conditions. You're either going to have it fully floating, which is where you start always with the back end canted up a little bit, and this, and it will always return to the same position where the back end is lifted up, and you'll have uh, with the depending on how high it's kicked up in its default position in, at equilibrium, you'll have a certain finite range of uh, upward pitch bend when you pull it backwards up, pull the arm backwards. And so there is a way of setting that range. Um, you don't want it sticking up miles high like this, um, but you, there is a kind of given range which tends to be a standard range of up bend is a tone, sorry, semitone on the high E, tone on the B and a tone and a half on the G. The reason they have different amounts of tone tunnel range for the same set tremolo is because they're different size and thickness of strings. It's just how it works. Um, if you want a tremolo where the a chord, for example, stays in tune, whoops, sorry, it's not very good looking. Uh, if you want a chord that stays in tune as you bend the tremolo, then what you want is an Evertune system. Right, so I'm just going to now uh, probably get the speedy up thing. Let's get that mechanical thing. I must remember to charge this. I must, I must. But for the speed, saving of time. Now I'm going to Make sure that the strings go downwards on the post this time, so that when we get to setting the ideal setup, we can, even at this stage, we can ascertain whether the, uh, whatever that string was, such and such string, G string, sorry, needs a, uh, needs a, um, an extra string tree for itself or not. So I'm just going to, Sort of zoom up a bit as I put these strings on. Now as I'm doing this the nut will move around because it's definitely not fixed in place and that's okay. So I'm just locking the string around and going underneath the bent of the string to begin with. Just sending the coils downwards as far as I can. Obviously the, like I say the nut will move until we've got more pressure on it and we hold it balanced out. Um, it may still try and move in which case we're just trying to live with it for the timing. Oh I forgot something. Well I'm before I get any of this done, I want to mark up the frets. Um, and I can mark them up now for this part. I could have also uh, covered them in, uh, masked them off. I'm so frightened of what the masking tape may do to this finish. <laughs> the Fender uh, North America finish, as I like to call it. FNAF. It's a bloody FNAF. Um, I'm sort of trying to hold off psychologically to the last minute. So I'm being very careful to uh, mark up these threads. Now, if you miss and you mark up the poly, you can use cellulose thinners. There goes the nut. That could have taken someone's eye out. If I had a trainee, an apprentice, I could have sent them to the hospital. Uh, yeah, if you, get, if you get black marker pen, um, don't be afraid to grab cellulose thinners and wipe it off quickly. You don't want it on there for a load of time, but poly urethane is quite happy, doesn't mind nitro cellulose thinners. So you can, you can, don't try and just rub naphtha on it until you scratch it. Just better, better go with the correct solvent. Obviously, don't do it that way if you are working on a vintage neck with nitro finish. And the battery is giving up. I'm going to have to use my DeWalt in a minute. And recharge this. Right, so I'm I, even having sent that G downwards, I think that's going to be precious little in the way of downwards angle. But we'll look at it together, and we'll make the call together. So it will be 
aim of the game right now is to finish this setup and read for it tonight. It's going well, but it isn't the end of the world if I don't, so I'm going to have to be re realistic. I'm just hoping to like to have it done. Right, now I'm slowing this all down for this job. I don't want spinning drill speeds when I'm doing uh, tuna turning. Okay. So these are going. These top two obviously are going to sit under the string tree on the way. Whoops! Coming up. Come along. Stay there. Won't keep turning it around, but we'll leave it for a minute. Now we'll just tuck it under there. Thank you. So first of all, those who know these guitars will see that the um, height that the that string tree holds the E and the B at is much higher up than the butterfly one, which was which was wound right down to the deck. So this is a much this has got an angle, but a better angle. It's not as extreme. It didn't need to be that extreme, basically. Okay, now I'm going to tune by hand. Now what I want to do is get it up to pitch, but I don't want the bridge to move forward. If it so happens that the bridge starts to move forward I will just go to the back and struggle my way into adding a bit more, well, bringing the claws screws in a bit further and that will, I just do it until I've got it basically locked down. So I don't want any movement, I want it to be effective at hardtail. So the quickest way is just to tune So looking at the back, this is still decked, which is fine. I've got some glue on the back here. Okay, so straight away, this is seated um, under at pitch with these 10, 1048s, which is what these are. We're not getting any kick up of the tremolo. So the tremolo is effectively locked, which is what I want. I'm just carefully stretching those to get them close to pitch. This nut is in good shape, it's, it's almost a drop in. That's lifted off. I could tell because that A string changed tune slightly there. So I need a little bit more push on here. <laughs> and it's, it's a very difficult thing to grab hold of these screws. The claw is even more in the way because it's a thicker built claw. It's a good looking thing. It feels lovely, looks lovely, but it's getting in the way. Okay, so that's now down, we'll tune up one more time. Okay, good. So now we have our tremolo locked, we have our new nut in place, we have our new string tree. I'm going to check the relief on the neck, which is very little, it's about 0.15, something like that. It's perfect. Um, but the action at this far end is too high. So I'm going to use the little thing and a thing, use my little adjuster hex key, and I'm going to keep feeling bits of dry glue here which I have to wipe off. Um, and look at what we've got here, wrong side, these are clean. We have got, we're, we're coming in at two millimeters so that's 
That's half a mil too high, so I'm going to go in by half a turn on each of these two, which equals, funnily enough, half a mil. Now, that's needed a little bit more. So I'm going to set these to my target action, and then I'm going to level, test play gently, and then level the neck for that target action. So this is still fractionally above the 1.5, which is my target action, nine and a half um, inch radius is can handle a 1.5 mil last action here and that is coming in at 1.5 so now we're going to do the same for here and take this down a bit so the good thing is is we're bringing these down a little bit off their back legs hind legs and then we're coming down to just under 1.5 and then we'll do a bit on this one I'm sort of doing it by eye moment because I'm sort of used to where it ends up on that one. Uh -huh, yeah. Is this even turning? It is, but this one isn't going down. Stay. Okay, so the idea is we're going to dial all these down to a sort of target reloved style low action and then we're going to level to that action which means we may, or Justin may want to go above that to play, maybe preference is to be a little bit higher than that, but what I then am able to know is that it can go down a little bit more without running into any buzz and chokes and the idea is that we always want an action to play at, we want to choke and buzz free playing experience at the chosen target action, or the action we've chosen. Um, and that's what we're aiming for. It's kind of close to my spread I think Okay, so what we've now got is new bridge set fixed flat. It's actually down only, but you call it locked. We've got a new nut, which is actually sitting at pretty nice heights, tiny bit of adjustment maybe on a couple of the slots. Um, new string tree. Um, we're not going to worry about the trim line for a minute. We're just worried about how does it play. Now what's really amazing is if every single note on this plays, then it will have been an extremely good refret. Ha! Huh. One. One slightly up. At least they give me some reason to do the levelling. So 20, the E and B, 20th, and we had B, 7, and 10. And we, oh, and 12. Okay. 
call this um, D8. D9. D12. So there's some room for work there, that's good. A8. So you'll see sometimes things come up in familiar patterns and you can see where like 12 is the initial across 12 on several strings. E8, so 8 and 12, 7, 8 and it's on the, yeah mostly. So good. It's better than not better than it being perfect, you know, you don't want it to be perfect. So here we go with the neck release set with the first and last fret actions good. I'll tweak the first fret action a bit later on, but with most of it perfect, um, we'll get our leveling gear ready. Now I now don't have my original brush, so I'm gonna have to use this to Thing. Mind. It was only a broken large scale paintbrush I was using before, so there's no reason why I can't just go and break another paintbrush and make it happen. Um, let's have a look and see what we can see. Um, oops, sorry, yeah, I'll do. So now we're on to the standard game. This, I've got to say, what's good is that this is no more or less amount of fret leveling than any factory neck. So I think I said earlier on, there's factories can't, I think yesterday when I was fretting, I said factories can't get it perfect. It's not possible. It's just a physical, mechanical, crude act. Ooh, uh, we're just pressing things rather crudely into things. That's how I like to see it. And therefore, it's not precise. So here we go. We're going to do our leveling using the legendary banana. And as always, with the first kind of run of the tool, it's going to give me fairly good diagnostic. And usually it reveals quite quickly what I know or what I've observed already in this uh, neck. So the 20th fret, the reason why it's buzzing, let me, let me help you understand. The reason why the 20th fret is buzzing on the E and B is shown here. See that? It's low. So everything else here is standard height. We've got a low here and a low there. And it's that low there that's making it buzz on the 21st fret when you fret at the 20th there. See that? So that tells me what I already know 20th is buzzing well 21st is buzzing but fretting at the 20th causes it to buzz there because this one is low not because the others are high now we do have some high ones and we've got a 13th fret which is high that one there 12th is sort of middling 9th uh, sorry 11th 10th actual 10th fret is um, Uh, just think my news item just says generic resigns. I'm supposed to have turned off the Bluetooth on this or 3G or whatever it was. Anyway, so we've got you can see where the dust is kicking up, as the Apollo mission said. You can see where this high fret says high on 13, a high on 9. Um, and so we are saying 8th fret, pressing the 8th fret causes the 9th fret to be high. I can't see what I'm doing. Yeah, so it ties in exactly with what I've found up there, which is which is why it's such a great system. So, and what's best about this system is it will allow me to uh, level everything without going further than I need to. So it may already have leveled as much as I need to. So let's just, for the sake of keeping this reasonably clean, because we don't want the thing board to 
get too dirty to begin with. Again, we can clean it off, but get rid of the sort of loose stuff. So the way to test it now is to go through. We go, so on the high E, everything was good, up to 20. Okay, so that's still low enough that 21 is, in 20, fretting on 20 is playing 21. So I still have to do some more work at that end to free up 20. So really, at this point in the game, all it really means is pressing down a little bit now, knowing I've got to just reduce 21 a little bit to allow 20 to play. You probably kind of figured out pretty quickly that a low fret actually dictates what you can do more than the high fret. So we've got a we've got quite a substantially different we've got a low fret and then possibly a high fret, but a low fret on its own dictates what you can do. But we're talking about such tiny amounts here that it it's not surprising. Very, very small amounts. There you go. Freed it. Now that's at the very low action that I've set, which is about 1.2 or even fractionally below that. So the next thing I'm going to do is going to move down with the same calibration of the tool down to the B track. And we know that we had the same problem at 20, uh, which means 21 was high and 20 was low in this case. Um, so I'm just going to do it all over a little bit and then we sort of already know where we've got to focus. And it's right on the end particularly. And that doesn't hurt. You can see Again, this dust kicks up where we've got issues. 13 was a problem, choking on 12 when we played 12. We've got nine here, which, which means 10 was choking on the B. So we've got that showing up there as a little patch of dust. So everything, when you get to familiar with how to do this, if you use this method, everything is great. It's a really great system for letting you basically reality sanity check as you go along. It's telling you it's confirming what you picked up in playing. Perfect. Cured that. Now we're going to recalibrate for the G track. Now the G track is an all important one because it's on the G track where if you're going to experience any chokes on bends it's going to be on the G track because by the nature of the geometry of this weird thing business is as you're bending an E string or a B string towards the G track, you're pushing those strings uphill. And as you push them uphill, the space that you would normally have for clearance, which isn't much going back down to your anchor point here, is the gap that you have available between the next fret so it doesn't choke, is actually reduced considerably because in reality your anchor point is down at the bottom of the three-dimensional space. So it's the G track that needs to be the most accurate when we're dealing with uh, choking or buzzing bends. So getting the, now I haven't checked for bends on this, um, but I'm going to level it first and then check with bends. So we, we, we'll, we'll go through and check with all the notes play first, and then we'll kind of hit on it for bends to be right. So looking at this, I'm seeing uh, uh, high 13th again, which is consistent, and a high 9th, which is consistent. We've got a consistently low 8th, which is why the 9th also seems high. Um, and we've got a low 20th, but it's just about picked up by the, by the time we've reached this G track. So nothing unusual, nothing surprising there. It's all playing out what I've marked up. But the best thing about it isn't just to sort of sit there and go, eh, see, I'm right. It's so that you know that what you're doing is working. Okay, so now I'm going to expect that bends tiniest bit of zing. They're all playing, but I then have the option now to go back into the G track and I know there's this little tiniest bit of zinging going on at that end. So I can replace the, the, the banana beam and really just a little bit more time at this end here, um, just to alleviate those little zing noises, which aren't even chokes, which is a great thing. We're not even in choke territory. They're playing the notes, 
but it's just starting to protest. And of course, remember that I've also got it set an incredibly low overall target action, flat neck, low action. So getting it to play here, this, this is really good. There you go. Ah, good. So having mastered the G, we now can recalibrate for the A, sorry, the D. <laughs> Remember which strings are which. Um, and on we go. So it's a great system. I absolutely swear by it. I swear at it and I swear by it. And you know what I've learned from it about the neck condition over the years has been amazing too. Now, here we are on the A. Now, we re when you come into the second half of the neck, what's interesting now is we're obviously going to tackle any high and low frets as in the first three string tracks. Um, but what we're also hoping now, and, and it's kind of like a, a mental switch, I'm also want to, uh, I want to alleviate much, as much as possible any what I would call um, slap in the strings. Now, the, Slap is where the usually the wound string, which moves more when played, the wound string is just short of enough room to move without hitting the frets. Hmm. Ping! Perfect. Um, and often, as you get lower, the big spinning of the wound strings, the bigger spins of the wound strings, can clip the frets. And that I've learned over the years, thanks to this method, is because not only are there individual high frets, but overall, the overall topography of the neck is a series of clusters of hills and valleys, clusters of high frets and low frets. And that uneven topography gets in the way of the smooth spin of these wound strings. So whilst they're not suffering from usually an individual high fret, um, what they can be suffering from is a cluster of high frets or a peak of a hill. And what I've discovered is the st stiffer curve of this U-channel style beam is perfect for removing any of the, of the, the peaks. They just sort of trim down the peaks so that they get out of the way of the spinning wound thicker string. And that by that token, you get rid of the fret slap. That is pretty damn good. Now we're going to calibrate for the low E finally, and so you can see we're on a on a nice run now. It's all going beautifully well. Fingers crossed. Do not blight everything, Sam. <clears throat> now I seem to have. Place this. What am I doing? That doesn't go there. It goes there. I thought I placed it in the wrong place. Okay. So again, important that we calibrate to the part of the track or the part of the neck ra radius that we're in. So this is why I call the low E track. Um, actually, it's north of the low E, of course, but it's good enough. Um, so now I'm going to level this out again, thinking more about fret slap. So I'm lighter on the touch with the beam at this point. And what I really want to happen is I want the beam's fixed curve, which is more, it's more of a smooth curve than the actual neck itself. So I want that artificially smooth curve of this beam to impose itself on the reality of this slightly hilly and imperfect curve called the neck. And when it does that, it clears out what I call the uh, fret slap and it's just a brilliant thing I've learned over the years with this and Of course it takes confidence to learn how to read it but Tiny bit of slap I mean it's not even slap it's a zizz right at the top end But now we know what to do we take our beam. I've turned it round just for a like throwing salt over your shoulder. I do it now and then and I'm focusing just at this top section. When I say focusing, I'm holding it so it's making contact there, but I'm just doing a little bit of downward pressure at this top end because I want to get rid of that little we had. 
So I can tell you right now I'm done. That's all of my leveling done. So that was a really good refret, if I may say so myself. Now obviously it won't be very much in tune at this point, but that's not important. Now we've got a beautifully leveled fret. The important thing about this method, as you've probably picked up if you've ever watched it or if it's your first time, you may it may not have escaped you that I've leveled the frets with the neck in the playing position under compression from the strings. If you do it with the neck, with the strings off, the neck is relaxed and it will it will it will level it while the neck's relaxed and you can get nice accurate leveling with a flat beam. As soon as you put the neck under load, it doesn't only bend into a curve, which isn't important as far as leveling is concerned, but what it does do, which is important, is it compresses it. And that compression causes this, accentuates this hills and valleys business. And so what was level when you were, uh, when you were checking with your rocker, suddenly when you put the strings on, will get buzz back in because the clearances are so tiny, um, it only takes a fraction to do that. So that's my learning over the years all summed up in a nutshell for you. Now, I have now officially... Uh, no, I haven't officially finished. I'm just going to re revise myself. Before I bin these strings, I might as well fine-tune the uh, action of first fret. because um, it's sort of a type of thing that you might as well use the old strings that you're going to throw away. So let me tune up. Everything's a bit dirty now. We'll clean up along the way. any file work here a really important thing to make sure is that your nut is as beautifully seated as it could possibly be so there we have it hidden away to oh my goodness camera work is just sublime so look it's under load from the strings it's it's fitted perfectly at that side um, and it's fitted pretty much perfectly on that side as well as as good as it will be actually so we have a perfect fit which means it's not going to suddenly drop down anywhere and we're not going to run into problems by cutting the slots too low or too whatever. Yeah, too low. Um, so here we go now. <laughs> I've got the Hosco files and I've got the uh, thingy me jig I call the metric feeler gators and that's what we're going to use. So I'm going to just pull these two off to the side and we'll start with the, the G. And now that is just a little bit still higher than the target I'm looking for. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm just going to use the G side of it and I'm going to try and just really use it mainly to widen the slot so there's no resistance. I'm going to be very careful with cutting. Now what I have used in the past, very reliable, is using this kind of jeweler's file, jeweler file. Um, sometimes I've done it like that where I use the jeweler's file because it's so reliable to do any cutting. Stop at the exact height. Just a little bit of a gap. Um, but it seems to be really dependable. And then re resort to my other file just to round out, very carefully round out the slot. Now I think that's about right there. So I'll keep to my word and I will round out the slot with this avoiding touching the back of the thing there. So that looks pretty much perfect. Now we go to the B, and again, it's very good already, but there's just a tiny little difference. So again, we'll start with the jeweler's file. It's funny that I've come back to using that. Um, it's, it's less likely to overcut for me than is the Hosco, believe it or not. It's just the way the diamond coated stuff is on here cuts at a more mm, dependable rate 
I have less worry about overcutting. Having said that, if you cut down a long way with this jeweler's diamond coated file, you run the risk of sort of running off sideways. It's quite easy to do. The slot can go off, off kilter. So I could say now let's try the, the 13 side of this, which is the B slot, and we've got to keep it away from the, uh, the maple on the back here. I think that's spot on. Now we've got the E, which again is a little too high. So we can either go straight with the 10 here, or we can do a little bit with this one. So then the Hosco file, this is good for digging down and moving earth, as I like to say. The Hosco file is great for widening and leveling out or shaping out the bottom of the slot. So now I go with the Hosco file, make sure it's both shaped nicely and wide enough. Perhaps a little tiny bit more. So this, um, this business of getting the first fret action correct is one of the most amazingly transformative aspects of guitar setup. And when you get this for the first time, it's like, what? How come I never knew this or I never did this right before? Once you get the first fret action right, your whole guitar changes the way it plays. Now this is actually almost spot on the right height. So what I'm going to use, this, I'm just going to check the width of this now, make, just make sure it's a nice clean friction free thing. And I think that's almost perfect height as it is. Now this one is probably a little bit higher. Yeah, so we'll take a tiny bit down on here. Again, the this one will move this stuff better, but it's sort of pointed at the bottom, so it's not really it's not really shaped for cutting down. So as we get to here, we're probably better off using the blue 36 on here and widening and a little bit down. But you have to be very careful. That's about spot on. If you get it where you think it is right, stop and call it a day. So often the this one is the hard one because it's thicker, obviously wider than all the rest, and its tendency is to force you to work harder at it. And before you know it, you can be too low. So just be very, very careful. Yeah, so the, the improvement that you're getting the first fret action right on your electric guitar, it, it's the biggest improvement for the smallest actual size change that you can possibly get. It's an amazing improvement. And it does the following things. First of all, it stops notes that you play near the nut from going sharp. And often, well, my experience is on electric guitars, if the notes that you play here, sorry, if the first fret action is higher than about 0.5, all the notes played on the first and second fret will go slightly sharp, and the nearer the nut, the sharper they'll go. That's because the action's too high, and they're having to press down, stretch a lot as they press down to meet the fret. So the amount of detuning that introduces is actually enormous, comparatively. So you really don't want that. The second improvement is when you've got as light as an action as I've got now here, um, everything here feels lighter. So playing like an F chord or a bar chord down here suddenly feels effortless. Um, uh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm just I'm still, let me just think. I'm trying to, I need to glue this neck, neck, this nut in right now while it's, while the going's good. So. I could do with a couple of strings here, here ready to do up. So I'm just going to undo these. And what I really want is to undo these a bit. And a bit. And I want to put a dab of glue on here and fit it. Yeah, so the, the, action, uh, the action down at that end comes incredibly light. And you won't notice really, you won't realize how light it is until you start playing it. And then you realize how light it wasn't previously. And that's the amazing thing about it. So this is a, this really is a, an 
immense improvement for a tiny amount of um, actual change. So I think it's it's just a massively good thing to do. So uh, this is always a slightly difficult thing. So we've got these two in the middle that we're going to do the holding down business, but we've got two flapping about slightly out of the way, which we can get out of the way now. So here comes the nut into position. Here comes our thingies over the top. Here's my fingers to press it into the correct uh, alignment and here's some pressure to hold it in place on both strings. And while we're at it then we can no harm in tightening up the other ones and putting these back on just for the period of time it takes to do up or glue them up. Ow. Ow, 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 come on please, help me. I wound on and spiked myself and I couldn't get it to undo quick enough. That's a hole. There you go. I didn't think you could actually hurt yourself putting on some strings uh, on a guitar where you've just changed the nut. Well, that's the downside of the, uh, the power tool. You see how much more, how much less controllable that is, because that dragged it onto my finger. Right, so I'm just basically that's fine. That's amazing. My finger ends must be quite hard because, as you can see, probably that's gone straight into the end of my. Where's the camera? Where is the camera this thing? It's gone straight into the end of my finger and managed to not draw any blood. It's just red. <laughs> well, well. Right, so there we have it. So, nut in place. I'm calling it glued. Time to now take the strings off. Tell me you're wearing out batteries too. Uh, I will hold off the decision still until we've got the new strings on about the uh, second string tree, but it's an easy thing to fit finally. Oh, ow. That was painful. <laughs> it was nothing like as bad as what I saw on Telegram today. And I know this isn't made for children, and I'm only going to make reference to it obliquely but I and I've seen many such things as I've told you before on this channel in watching the uh, Ukraine Russian the Russian defense of its homeland from the Ukraine sorry the other way around Ukrainian defense of its homeland from the Russian invaders um, but I saw a, a drone drop today which divided somebody in two and um, and then the drone operator sort of zoomed in just to make sure um, and it was just um, almost impossible to it's not impossible to imagine it's frankly easy to imagine but it's just what a terrible terrible way to go and I suppose all you can hope for is that it's as quick uh, as anything and I, I've did, said this before but in the past I've um, I've been I, I was in a, in a bad bike crash years ago so that's zoomed out oh yeah in a bike, bad very bad bike crash and what I learned in that bike crash which was this is gonna hurt isn't it ah! um, what I learned was that your nerves are actually slower than you think they are thank God um, because when you have a traumatic accident, uh, they, the pain, the, uh, yeah, the, the nerves, or the, your body shuts down faster than the um, nervous system can take the pain signals to your brain. Which is, um, I mean, if there was one thing 
to, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in creators and so on, but if you believed in one, that would be absolutely a very, very good reason to be massively thankful to such an imagined or a believed a putative creator God to make it that way round, eh? I mean, there's plenty of other things you could say, perhaps not. Um, I'm doing this and I've got another stage to do, which I, never mind, I'm going to do this first and I'll do the next stage. Um, yes, it, it's just a, a really good and amazing thing to be grateful for, I would say, that uh, it turned out that way, let's call it. Um, because if it were another way around, I would have had a terrible, terrible time. As it is, I had a bit of a terrible time when I got to the hospital and you, know, you sort of come back to whatever and you feel it. But if it, if it had been the end for me, if it had been curtains, then I wouldn't have known and that would have been painless, so to speak. Anyway, so I'm hoping that it was such, so thus, for that fellow on the battlefield that I observed becoming two persons, perhaps. Anyway, now this is a bit that anyone who's worked on a Mexican or American strap before will understand and, and be sweating along with me because in the past masking tape has been the cause of uh, the finish taking a hike on these guitars. Um, and of course you've got to do it, you, there's no way you can polish these, sensibly polish these or recrown and polish these strips out without um, masking off like this. So it's the point of resignation and it comes down to if it's going to do it to me, it's going to do it to me and we just have to live with it and that's all there is and isn't to it. Anyway, so far everything's feeling good. Um, well, when it comes to uh, the polishing out, we want to put some effort into it with uh, sanding the edges. We've got to make sure we get down around the edges to soften them up so that they're as soft as they can be. So that fret ends that do dishes can be soft as something with my old green. I just remembered! I've sang the fairy liquid song. Before I went out the house, Claire said to me, oh God, we're out of fairy liquid. We're washing fairy liquid. Out of washing, dishwashing stuff. And I said to her, I've got some at the office. I said, but I've just written, already written out my to-do list on my hand and it doesn't involve bringing fairy liquid. So I said, can you text me with your high technology phone system and tell me to bring the fairy liquid? And I probably would have forgotten all about that had I not reminded myself by singing the fairy liquid song. And there we have it. So the hands that do dishes can be soft as your face with mild green, smelly liquid. Those old days, the simple old days, eh? Nanette Newman, wasn't it? Used to run about down a long line of tables saying things like, um, Look, ordinary dishwashing liquids run out by now in our our silver jubilee celebration, and Her Majesty would be very disappointed or that implication. But fairy keeps on going longer and longer and longer. TM Duracell Bunny ad. Weren't they fun, those old ads? First they bash, was it first they peel them, ah, then they boil them for 20 of their earth minutes, ah, then they smash them into little pieces. Ah. That was classic, wasn't it? Just wasn't it? Just wasn't it? Wasn't it just? And the thought was, I mean the funny part was I suppose we, we kind of looked at that as if the, the aliens were advanced and, and smart and that any enlightened being would of course eat this powdered garbage called smash. Mm. 
I mean, really, I, I think I rem if I can, any of them here remember eating smash. Not getting smashed, I remember that. But can you remember eating a smash? <laughs> it was vile. I mean, it was horrible. It was, it was, and, I, and when I re re reflect on it now, it's, it's like, you know, you knew you were eating something made in a laboratory st staffed entirely by tin men, you know, tin people. There was a female tin person, wasn't there, an alien? But yeah, it, you know, it, it just absolutely fitted with that sort of Doctor Who style laboratory. It was just so unnatural. Anyhow, nobody in their right mind now <coughs> would eat <coughs> a processed fake powdered potato. And what was the obsession with not having water in it? Just add water. Oh my, that's amazing. What an innovation. Just add water brackets and optional nutrients so what I'm doing here what am I doing here what I'm doing here is I'm preparing yonder frets to be recrowned and I'm struggling because I didn't cut the masking tape properly on some of these strips so it's not plain ball anyway yeah so we're going to paint over the frets again even though I've already cleaned them off once. And then we are going to recrown them. And after that, polish them out and then smash them into lots of pieces, little pieces. For fret leveling, get bananas. Oh, my finger. Charlie bit my finger. I name that string Charlie. That tuna. Tuna? Anyway, so here we go. All the fun of the fair with recrowning, and then I'll switch off for the polishing out bit because it's boring and repetitive. And when I switch off, I get a chance to put something on the YouTube and retain my sanity for five minutes. And now I'm going to do a little something here. You never know. You never did know. You never did know. Sometimes, sometimes, all I need is occasionally, I don't know why, but sometimes lettering comes off pickups if you cover it over. So just to ensure that it doesn't, I'm protecting it first before I get near it with the green stuff of doom and, and so I'm just yeah making sure I think it's amazing that somebody some people collected together all those ads a lot of them came from before there was strictly videotape, I suppose. Was, you know, a lot of companies didn't keep copies of them, maybe. And yet, I still, somebody has collected them together, and there is a, a superb amount of them still available to be enjoyed, inverted commas. Right, so here we go. Time to repaint these, ready for the crowning. And fret crowning is where you actually get to see how much or how little um, metal you actually took off your frets. Now these, I could afford quite a lot on these anyway because they're, they're tall, relative, relatively tall compared to the ones that were there relatively because they're new, obviously. Um, so we have leeway, which is always good, but we'll see that they didn't really cost that much in terms of metal, even for um, whatever we had to do. Now for some reason, the color all went completely mad. Sorry about that, must have been talking to talking about old adverts or something. Right, so I'm gonna put a little footprint under there to keep that still. And here we go. So very, very little in the way of working to do, so hardly any uh, flattening took place. So if you don't if it takes any time at all, 
any time at all. Da -da -da -da. Then you've hardly done any leveling. And we'll know, we'll recognize the ones we come up to. So for example, nine and 13, I think, we expect to spend a bit more time on. Any time at all, all you gotta do is call. And I'll be there. Here we go, we're on nine. I can see it already. Needs a bit of care, love and attention. Ooh, ooh. So we got ten, a bit on this edge here. Eleven. A bit in the middle. Twelve and thirteen we know we'll need it. Twelve's quite low. Thirteen is high. High. Probably the highest one there in terms of having to work it. There we go. 14, nothing to write home about. 15, barely touched it. 16, 17, 18, a bit more on 18. Nineteen, nothing, twenty, nothing, but we expect twenty-one to be a bit hit on, which it is. Okay, there we are, that's it, that's the crowning done. So now, we'll leave the paper on there. The next stage is to cut some sandpapers and I'm going to polish out the frets. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make some, roll some paper up here in the, in the style of a little bit of, a little bit of two, 180 and some 240. I'm just going to hang this guitar up a minute out of the way. And then what I'm going to do is, see, so I'm going to just square off the ends of this. So I'm going to use this for what we call it, softening up the fret ends. Um, because I've put masking tape on them, I should be able to get away without taking off too much or any uh, that's the stuff. Finish. So if you go at the edge with um, go at the edge with some sandpaper before you've papered it, uh, you know thingied it off, mask it off. You can take a bit more of the, the uh, poly off the edge. Um, so to try and avoid that, if you need to soften off the frets, it's a good idea to do it. So there's a couple of ways I do it. First one is I make a little tube. Well, one way I do it. I make a little tube of sandpaper. This is quite hefty stuff, 180. So, Guitar back, bring the guitar back, and I'm going to just make it slightly concave, and I'm going to bend up and down the edge like this. Now it's obviously going to cut into the paper a little bit, so if you do it for too long, it, it's possibly going to cut through the paper there. But, just a good way of just rounding off more organically um, to begin with, and then we can follow up with softer grit paper. And then what I do for that is to use this Again, wrap it up, wrap it up, roll it up, wrap it up. <clears throat> you can even put a bit of tape around it to keep it in one shape. I saw um, a, a message come in just now from my old schoolmate Steve, who's got his Gretsch, so he's happy and he's showing it off. Okay, so now I'm going on to 240, wrap around there, and again, a slightly convex. Next. 
So 240 being a lighter grip and keep sort of turning it as I go so that it's it's not kind of just worn away in one spot. <coughs> Okay, so that's not a bad start for the sanding process, but I will have to now tear up some tear up some sheets, and I'll come back to you once I've done the uh, polishing out, and then we can basically get into final checks, stringing up, and setting the uh, thingy in a thing tremolo, but also deciding whether we need a second uh, thing. <laughs> You know what I mean? String tree. Right, see you in a bit. What a disaster. I filmed the whole of the previous thing without sound on here. Now, and then I've gone and pretended I was going to uh, recharge and forgot to switch the power on at the recharger. So basically, got absolutely nothing recorded properly. I've got it on the overhead camera, which I'm going to have to re refer to, rely on again. So anyway, so now I'm going to get this um, done <laughs> as quick as I can. And for that, I'm just I'm going to have to use a, f a power thing because the battery's going to run out any minute. And if they do, that's the end of that. So I don't really have time. How silly. Right, da, 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 da. right, one, one, one. Okay. Uh -huh. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's do it. Another way around. Over the top. Under. And the second time round. <laughs> anyway, I, I buffed the neck again um, with the frets as well, so the frets are nicely buffed and as much of the um, slight, what do you call them, uh, scrap, sanding marks are gone as possible, but there's a limit to how, you can, how well you can do it. Oh dear, what terrible, terrible camera work. I should be ashamed. Anyway, sorry about that bad sound all the way through except for this last bit which will conk out because the batteries are nearly run out anyway so I'm just basically getting the strings on um, and then we'll stretch them and then we'll do the tremolo float if we can do it without the batteries running out <laughs> right let's try and get this G see if we can make, make the G sit low as low as possible all the way through, pull back one fret's worth, start winding. Over the top of the loose one to begin with. And then under next time round and subsequent times round. I mean that looks that looks straight through. I think we've got to have another string tree there. No matter how I lower it down, it's gonna need it. It cannot find the correct angle on its own. Okay, anyway. Oh dear, terrible camera work. Probably been a while since I used the proper camera and the mic and whatever, I think, maybe. Oh well. I'll go straight into stretching, I'll cut the stuff and spare bits off afterwards. Just I want to get the stretching and the tremolo bit done. Well, we've got a bit of battery life. Oops, get in there. Okay, up we go. Right, so. Not, oh God, please don't do this to me. Can I not be in low power mode? Oh well, it's going to conk out any second now. So we do the stretching <laughs> as quick as we can. <laughs> nice big 10 to 48 chunky strings. <laughs> so the idea for the tremolo set um, if it conks out, I might take it home and film it at home tomorrow when the when I've charged up again. Might be a, a better thing to do. So perhaps I'll do that. Say rushing it because it's good to see the um, the tremolo setup.
we're not lifting up at the back no we're still down good and solid keep going just for a minute so more stretching out the good thing about um thicker strings is of course they they'll stabilize tuning quicker than thinner strings normally I think we've got to get ourselves uh, a new a new hole, a new one of these. Let's get ourselves the pokey thing, the important pokey thing. <laughs> On target. Drill two, double speed. Change. Need a slightly bigger one again. Come on. Which one do I need and where's it gone? It's this one here. 2.5, no, it's the three. No, it's not that one. Get it right. Get it right. Well, I thought it was two and a half, but I've already done the two and a half one. Haven't I, haven't I? No, I didn't. Weird. Okay. Uh-huh, 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 not that. Where's the screw gone? There it is. <laughs> one of these, one of those. I'm just going to keep on going, hoping that you're going to stay running until we're done. That will do. Okay, give it a bit of stretching. Pulling faces, stretching strings. Okay, are we running? Oh, just about. So the way we do this is we get the wire, the tuner wire. We get the tuner. We get some, we get some, 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 some. We get some notepad, sticky notes, sticky notes. We tune, tune to E, tune to pitch. Tune to pitch, get some sticky notes, and then we take the G. Oh, haha, <laughs> we do something else beforehand. Right, because there's an action implication here, as we raise it up to the desired level of um, tremolo movement, um, we're going to lose some height. I'm going to need to get my little cloth and clean off the pickup because I have got muck on the pickup. Oh, you are kidding me. You are kidding, Mr. Hitler. Who do you think you are kidding? 
That's just incredible. A bit of... Uh, I'll continue cleaning that afterwards, but the point is, we go tune to pitch, Actually, we'll leave that. What we'll do is we'll do the action adjustment, which is hidden away from me now. Where have I put the damn thing? Come on, you had it a second ago. Did I just pick it out? No, it's missing. I've now lost my mind. Hello, is it me I'm looking for? Right, so the idea is we're going to go down half a millimetre on each of these. So half a millimetre. <laughs> turn. What's happening now is I'm taking the whole of the action down by half a mil, lower than my target action would be. Because this is because I'm going to raise the playing action up as I set the tremolo to float, fully float. So there's a, a resultant raise in action <laughs> to maintain the target action that we want. I have to reduce the playing action. Uh, so yeah, reduce the action by that half a mil that it's going to gain. Now if you try to play it now, you might get buzzed because it's half a mil shorter, uh, lower than it should be. But it's going to go up once we set the float in the tremolo. Right, so we've tuned it. Now we're going to put the tremolo arm in. I don't know if the power's still going. I hope it is. Tremolo arm in. Is it push in? I think it's a push in. Yeah. Okay, tremolo arms in. And now we're going to make we're going to make this G. Why is it? Why is it now? So just putting this tremolo arm in has made. <laughs> Right, so we now play the G. Depress it until it becomes E. And you use as many post-it notes as you need to. to get down to the E. Now the sheet. Or two. Two stuck together. Uh, yes, now we tune it to E. To pitch, basically.
Okay. Okay, now we let go and it goes sharp. Now what we do is we dial out, whereas I think we dial out these until it becomes the G again. So G sharp. In the right place. I'm a bit concerned about this. This doesn't appear to have done things the way I want them. Oh, it's G sharp. It's quite a bit higher. So we're not starting from all the way in, which is probably what's confusing me. We're actually a fair bit further out than I would normally start, just mainly because of this thing's impossibility of dialing it all the way in. So the idea is we tune it back out until it, that G note becomes G again, and then it will be flo floating, and it will be floating at the correct height for the range of bend we want. We're nearly there, like a quarter of a turn on each one. Quarter of a turn again. Not that you can actually get any access to there, but hey. So. Tiny bit lower again. So that's the beauty of this. You tune the claw screws out until you're back in tune. Here we are. Check the action again, which should, all being well, have returned to our target. Although it might be different if we haven't gone at one point. Wow, it's a little under 1.5 on this side, so we can make a tiny adjustment here, a tiny bit up. to just dial in those uh, tremolo screws a tiny bit more, put this flat on here, because they are just now standing fraction proud. Put this back in. Okay. 
that, my dears, is where we are. And we may have got complete with the thing still running. That's incredible. We still managed to keep running. I'm going to cut those things off in a test blade at home. But there we have it, refretted. Uh, needs polishing as usual. Tremolo up at the correct angle. Small amount of backward movement. Um, everything else. Good. Thank you for watching. Sorry about the terrible sound and my mistakes with the camera, as always. I'll see you soon for another one.